it's a public holiday. Thank you for coming and spending the afternoon uh, with me. This, uh, th this is a workshop, uh, like a, a, new, a new workshop that, um, this is only the second time I've given it, given it publicly. Um, and I'm rereading uh, re the material and preparing for it. I I'm really excited about uh, the, the, the things, I, things I have to share. Um, so th there needs to be a little bit of explanation about where this, where this workshop came from. A couple of years, I had this, uh, years ago, I had this idea, um, and tweet size being what they were, it was called Three Rules for Dating My Code Base. Like, if there are only three rules of things that I'd like to agree on when we work together, this, this would be them. Um, of course, the next day, I was like, oh, I forgot. I, here's three more. Um, and it probably, it probably could have kept going on for some time. Um, and so so this, this idea of, like, like what are the... What are the, like, like the bullet points of good go code? We're, we're kind of floating around in my head. Um, at the same time, or perhaps a, a few years earlier, um, I talked to O'Reilly about, about writing a book on Go. Um, but it kind of fizzled out for, 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 for two reasons. Um, O'Reilly's document presentation uh, preparation system is pretty good, uh, but it's, it wasn't as flexible as I wanted. And I felt like if I was going to be spending hours and weeks and months of my, my day like preparing this document there are a lot of um, kind of undefined steps like like, uh, like the the O'Reilly system you would upload a document but once you started digging into it with your editor they're like oh yeah we copy that into something else and then we we edit it ourselves um, and I didn't like that I was like well I'm gonna put all the time into writing this document I want to have control over my words and then there was some more uh, unfortunate calculus of just how much time it was going to take. I'm not, I'm not going to put Bill on, the, Bill on the spot and ask him how many hours he spent on his book. Um, what, 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 re reading online, people spend 500 hours. Um, Igor Grelick, who did a book on HTTP, said he, he, because he's very meticulous, kept meticulous record, and he said he spent 981 hours. Um, that's three quarters of a year. And the problem is that if you don't finish the book, there's no partial credit. Maybe O'Reilly or who, whichever publisher is going to rehome your book, and maybe eventually it makes its struggles out onto the market. And the, the, the difficulty was that this felt like an old world way of software development, like where you'd have architects who would say, this is, this is how we're going to write the software, and it's going to take 18 months to implement, and it's going to be in testing and validation for six months, and then it's going to be in three... Like this waterfall way of developing software is discredited. Yet this is exactly how books are written. Um, and so this workshop, um, the document you're reading, the talks that I give, the blog posts that I have is kind of my, my hack, my life hack on how to write a book that you get partial credit for. Like people can, people can um, get the value, I can get feedback earlier, um, and I can stop at any time and nothing is lost. Um, also, this, this document is uh, li liberally licensed. Feel free to, to link it, to reference it, to, like, to take bits and blog, blog about it. If you come from other countries, take it home and give it up your local meetups, however you want. Um, it's open source, free as in beer. And the other thing I want to mention before we get started is that the more that I, I research and I read, I, I read the texts about programming written in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, like trying to find some truth, like what is the absolute truth, like what is the one way to write good software, the more I find that there are no rules. In fact, the, the deeper you get, the less certain I feel about everything. Um, and and one, one way I kind of rationalize this, um, this realization is so M M Malcolm Gladwell, I think, wrote about this kind of 10,000-hour rule, you know, to become a prof a proficient in anything. And the thing is, it isn't just about, like, you, 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 could, you could become a, a, a Star Trek fan by watching 10,000 hours of Star Trek, but could you write a new Star Trek? Well, you, you, you probably have a, a start at it, like you, you read all the reference material, but do you have any practice in writing? Do you have any practice in editing, editing scripts and that feedback? So I think... One of the takeaways is 
is, yes, it might be 10,000 hours, but you spend it equal parts learning and researching and equal parts practicing and doing. That's very much how it works in the mechanical, um, mechanical ways. And that, that's what I think ultimately contributes to what you call experience. So with that, these are my experiences. These are things that um, I've tried to distill of the things that have worked for me or the way that the, the realizations I've had. Um, but it's, it's not prescriptive. Like, 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 feel free to disagree. Feel free to pick and choose. Like, like you, 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 nothing is lost if you disagree with one point, but you find value in the others. So the subtitle of this document is Best Practices in a Programming Language. Um, and so if I'm going to use an absolutist word like best, like if this is the best, then everything else is not as best or worse, then I need some kind of framework to say what, we, what I mean by that. Brian Cantrell gave a really interesting presentation, um, not actually about programming languages, it was about operating systems and talking about the guiding principles of different operating system projects. Um, and the, the, the summation of that is different operating systems have different core values. I mean, he makes the, he makes the, 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 the somewhat impudent, impudent point that OpenBSD care only about security. Everything else is secondary. But the, 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 the point there is not that they discard every other, every other possible goal, like usability or performance. It's when you have to choose. You have to choose a core set of, goal, core set of principles. And so what then do I think are some principles that define how I think about Go? And to give some background about this, this is a, this is a quote that, that Russ Cox, I think, gave at GopherCon Singapore last year. He's certainly been, certainly been making the rounds. And it's his observation, paraphrased from his co-worker Titus Winters, that software engineering is what happens to programming when you add time and other programmers. I mean, he's making a decision between a distinction between programming and software engineering. Programming is typing on a keyboard. It's writing a program to do a particular thing. It's writing a throwaway script. It's writing some uh, some SQL to do a data transformation. It's a single use job that does uses a computer for one time, does its job, and it's over. Engineering is always has, has a component of time. Um, for the, for the software projects that you work on, people are going to join, people are going to leave, teams are going to grow and shrink, you're going to get new requirements, features are going to be added, bugs are going to be fixed. This is what, this is what underpins software engineering. So if we say that the underlying goal is good software engineering, then what are some of the principles that Go brings to the table? And I'm going to make the case um, that they are clarity, simplicity, and productivity. Now, as you see, I, you know what I didn't say? Performance or concurrency. Um, there are some languages which probably on paper are a little bit faster than Go, but they're not as simple as Go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to just pick on Rust and C for that. There are languages which make concurrency their highest goal. Like Erlang, everything you do is concurrency. Um, but I argue they're not as clear, they're not as readable, and ultimately the, the, the productivity that engineers get from them is, is lower. So let's dig into these a little bit. Code is read many, many more times than it is written. Um, a single piece of code over its lifetime, if you consider, if you consider something like the standard library or a common common library or even just a library that is used inside your company. Every single programmer in that company has kind of read the source of that several times at least versus the number of people who actually contributed to it over time. So if you're writing a program for yourself, maybe it only has to run once, the only ever program, you're the only person who's ever going to see it, just do whatever the hell you want. It doesn't matter. Like, like, Nobody else has to maintain this throwaway script. But if it's a piece of software that's going to be used, for more than, used by more than one person, used over a long enough time and the, the requirements are going to change, 
uh, the environment it runs in are going to change, then fundament fundamentally, your goal for this program must be that it is maintainable. So the second, the second goal is probably the one that people think about the most when they think about Go, which is simplicity. Um, why, why do we care about simplicity? Why is it important that we place this goal above others? I think it's fair to say that we've all been in situations where you say, I've looked at this code, I can't understand it. I can't understand it. Um, I'm sure many of you have been in the situation where you've been asked to maintain a piece of code and you looked at it and you're like, I don't understand what that's doing. I'm pretty sure if I touch it, I'm going to break it. Um, it's the part you don't understand. It's the part you don't know how to fix. And this is fundamentally complexity. Complexity is what turns reliable software into unreliable software. Complexity is what ultimately kills software projects. If you can't read it, you can't maintain it, and if you can't maintain it, your only choice is to replace it. So, simplicity must be one of our highest goals. Whatever programs we write, we should be able to at least agree that they are simple. Now, how, how you define that in the absolute can be for interpretation, but the opposite of simplicity is complexity. If people say, I can't understand that, it's too complex, that's a problem. I love this quote from Sandy Metz. Design is the art of arranging code to work today and to be changeable forever. And that's kind of under, underlies what I think is the, the final principle um, of, of Go, productivity. Now, it's, it's kind of out of, out of place because like, like simplicity, clarity, like there are words we understand. Productivity is kind of like, like, a, th like a thing that you do. I'm going to be productive today. You don't say I'm going to wake up today and be simple. So I'm going to work up today and be productive. But I think you can boil it down to productivity is how much time do you think you spend doing useful work versus a whole day lost in the code, I can't, can't understand what's happening, um, or spending all your day arguing with, fighting with CI or something like that. So fundamentally, Go programmers should, can, should feel they can get a lot done in Go. That's what I mean by productivity. That's one of the explicit design goals of the language, that when you're working in a team with other engineers, it doesn't feel like you're, you're working uphill, like the language should work with you in that team environment. And there are plenty of cases where other languages don't, don't work well in a, in a shared environment. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to pick on any contemporary languages, but Smalltalk was a, an amazing example of this. It was amazingly it was an amazingly beautiful language, but it didn't use source code. It had this uh, binary object model of the world. You didn't save your program. You serialized the whole memory out to disk. How can you collaborate like that? How can you share a diff of my binary state versus yours? So your, your productivity in that environment would be drastically left. You, you can't share code with other people. You have to describe how you change the thing and they apply that transformation to their model. Um, and th th there's a joke that, that um, Go was designed waiting for a C++ program to compile. This isn't, th this, this isn't just hearsay. There is from Rob's talk, I think it was called uh, more is uh, Less is Exponentially More. Um, he talked about going to see a I spent a lunch, saw a lunchtime lecture about new things happening in C++. And he went back to his office, made one tiny change to the code he was working on, pressed, pressed enter to compile, and that was 45 minutes. He would have to wait. And he said he turned around in his chair to his office mate, who was Ken Thompson, and said, I can't do this anymore. Like, we have to, we, we, we have to rethink. The, this was one of the genuses of, of Go. So compilation speed is one of the ways that we feel, we feel productive. It's a concrete example of that. One of some of the earliest things written about Go say they want to give you the safety uh, and concurrency of a static language, but with the produ productivity of a dynamic language. So think of Google back 
10 years ago, Python, Python was, the, uh, was one of the three languages. And so they were directly uh, competing for the mind share of Python programmers who were used to working in a REPL. And in, 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 ter in terms of the last kind of founding document, there is uh, the splash document from 2012, which is explicitly titled uh, Software Development in the Large. It's what uh, Rob and Russ talk about when they say the language has got to scale. This is industrial scale programming. This is kind of, if, if, if you stretch the analogy of, of manufacturing, to, to, to some degree, manufacturing works when you have, when you have many actors working at once together. So these are, these are the guiding principles that, that guide what I describe in this document. Um, I really like the way that, that Robert Martin described um, principles. So like, like if, if you think about like how do, you raise your, how do you raise your children, you say, always tell the truth, don't steal, don't lie. But when you, when you, as you go through your life and a friend to you says, does this, you know, do these, these pants make me look fat? Do you tell the truth? Maybe, may, may, maybe you choose for, for the sake of harmony. You say, yeah, they look great. Um, they're, they're principles, they're guidelines. Sometimes you bend them, sometimes you don't follow them. You do it uh, with the explicit understanding that there's a reason, that there's, there's a reason, there's, there's a, uh, a trade-off. But always, when faced with a choice, you start with your, your core principles. Okay. So the, the first topic I want to discuss is identifiers. Um, an identifier is just a fancy word for a name, the name of a function, name of a method, name of a package, name of a type, name of anything. And the odd thing is that given the quite limited syntax of Go, the names we choose for the things in our program, because we have so little flexibility everywhere else, the names have an oversized impact. Um, readability is one of the defining qualities of good code. Um, choosing good names is crucial to being able to read the code. Um, a concrete example of this, when we rewrote the compiler from C to Go, the original C compiler um, was what people used to call Ken CC because none of the identifiers were longer than five letters. The reason for that was because that's how they used to do it on the PDP-11 back in the 60s. Um, Yukaya Smith made this interesting observation, like, obvious code is important. Like, what you can do in one line should be in three. Like, we don't optimize for clever one-liners in Go. Like, I know in Python you might have loose comprehensions, and in, in, in Ruby it, it's, it, it's a real art to, like, map, fold, reduce, and a little block on the end. That's considered not just to be clever Ruby, but good, idiomatic Ruby style. Go is not like that. We optimize not for the size on disk or how many lines we use on the page, but for the reader, always for the reader. And key to this clarity is choosing good names. Um, so some, some of the qualities that define a good name over a bad name, like again, going back to, we, we need to have a framework to say, this is good, therefore that is bad. A good name is concise, like, like it, 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 needn't be, uh, it needn't be the shortest name, but a good name should waste no space on things which are um, extraneous. We, we don't in Go put eyes in front of types that are interfaces. Why? It's not necessary. A good name is descriptive. It should describe how the variable or constant is being used, for example. It shouldn't describe what's their contents. A good name should describe the result of a function or a behavior of a method, not how it does that thing. It should describe what it's going to do for you, not how it's going to do for you. A good name should describe the purpose of a package. It shouldn't describe what's inside it. And the better the, the, better the choice of a name, 
the more accurately describes the thing it identifies. And also, a good name should be predictable. When you see a name, a, a name in a common, a common word that you understand, it should, it, it, it should spark uh, an understanding of what that thing is for. Um, a little bit later, I show an example. If you find a variable called DB, I think everyone here would argue, well, that's probably something to do with the database. It's, it's, not, it's, not, just, it's not just that database starts with D DB, it's that that's what we've grown as a tradition, that DB means database. So when you see a DB, you expect you're talking about a database. Sometimes people criticize Go's style for short variable names. Um, very much this grows from uh, some of the original, like the original Go code, which um, people call Pike style, because uh, that was the name of a document that came out, I think 1996, uh, which was, uh, th it was called pikestyle.pdf. Um, the, 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 the real title of it was uh, some, some, notes, uh, some notes on program design in C. So this was, this was Rob, Rob Pike's very condensed version of, of this document. And so, given that Rob was one of the three authors of Go, then the kind of predominant naming style that comes out of Go uh, is influenced by that. But there, there, are, there are some, it's not simply we're just going to do what Rob says. There are some well thought out guidelines behind this. Um, short variable names work well when the distance between the declaration and the last time they're used is short. The longer a variable name is, it needs, to, it needs to pay for that, it needs to justify that. Um, lengthy bureaucratic names just simply, just used everywhere, ab actually obscure what they're doing. Like they're, you, you spend more time reading the name than reading the code that operates on the name. Similarly, we, we don't tend in Go to include the name of the type in the name of your variable. Um, we don't need to. We have a compiler for that. It'll spot, it'll spot it when you get wrong. So let's actually look at an example of that. Let's make that teeny bit smaller. So here's, a, here's an example probably written in cl close to idiomatic Go style. Um, I think idiomatic Go style is kind of uh, something you can, you can argue about. But let's, we have a, a mix of, uh, a, a mix of uh, identifier lengths. For example, this P here, um, it's declared on this line and it's only used once more on the next line over. P is only declared inside the scope of that for loop. It doesn't live for very long and it's only used as the, the loop induction variable just for adding up the sum. So it doesn't live for very long, so we shouldn't spend a lot of time naming it and, care, and caring about it, because the reader doesn't need to read it for very long. We have other ones like people, the parameter, or count, which live for a longer time, like physically on the page. So uh, we, give them, we give them longer, longer names. Now, I could have chosen S for sum and C or possibly N for count. But that would have meant that all of the variables in this function were single letters. And so the opportunity to say which are the more important ones or ones that live for longer has been lost. Um, also, by choosing uh, P for people, um, I'd need to think up another thing for the, the range induction variable. And just as a, just as a note, um, this is something that Kevlin, Kevlin Henney talks, out, talks about. Consider using white space in the same way that you use what you'd use white space in a document. You break up, you break up paragraphs with, with some white space between it. So in this function, the different parts of the functionality, um, first of all, 
the check of the length, and then the loop, and then the returning the value, we kind of separate them that. Maybe you agree, you agree with that, maybe you don't, but I really like this, this notion of if a function does several things, just in the same way that a, um, a document has a paragraph with several different ideas or several different subpoints, you break them up with white space. And to go back to talking about guidelines versus rules, it's important to recognize that all of this is contextual. Um, <coughs> if, I, if I had applied my, uh, my earlier recommendation here, we'd have, if that body of the index was quite long, we'd say for index colon equals zero, index less than the length, index plus plus. But is that fundamentally more readable than this? Because all I is do is count is counting the loop induction. It's not. It's, it's it's just it's just a number. The only place it's mutated is right there on that line. Otherwise, it's just used as a counter or as some reference. So, making it longer doesn't necessarily introduce the in, increase the comprehension of the function. And again, there are there are always counter arguments to this. Um, which of these is more readable? We have, um, have a function with OID and index. Now, if it was a very, like, fetch, you might think it was a getter or something like that. If we shorten OID to just O, it means that programmers have to translate. In SNMP, OID is called object ID. It's already a contraction, and it's the name that everybody talks about the identifiers in SNMP. So by introducing, by calling it O, now everyone who, in all the documentation, all the RFCs about SNMP and all the other libraries and everything you Google about, they, they know it as OID. Now all of a sudden they have to translate in their head, O means OID, O means OID. And the reason, uh, the reason that we call it index, not I, is don't mix and match long and short long and short parameter names. Again, for readability, like don't, if one is very, if, if one is spelled in full, make the others as well. Similarly, if you're going for short variable names, make them more short. Naming, naming your variables, like giving them a suffix with their type, um, is the same reason you don't name pets, dog and cat. Like my, my dog's name is called Frank. It's not Frank dog. It's very, very obvious she's a dog. So the, the name of your variable should describe its contents. Um, con consider not the type of their contents. So consider the example. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure you've probably seen code like this in, in various places. Users map is a map of string to user. Um, what's good about the declaration? We can see it's a map, obviously. I mean, we don't need to, we don't need to say map right here. It says map literally one character to the left. But more importantly, users map is a map because we have a statically typed language. And so you're not going to accidentally use it where you're expecting something else. The compiler is going to stop you accidentally using uh, a map. Like in, in other languages where there's a lot of dynamic coercion, like Ruby, JavaScript, things like that, you probably, you, it, it may be good practice to encode the way you're supposed to access this variable actually in its name. Because if you don't, the language will try and transform it into the way that you, the way that you tried to access it, and maybe that'll be wrong. But to make this argument a bit, a bit further, consider what happens if we were to declare some other variables, like we have some users, we get some companies, we have some products, you think in some kind of sales system or HR system. And so now we have users map, companies map, product map. We know their maps, it's right there in the definition. We also know that the de their declaration prevents us from transposing them. You can't put a company into a product. It's just not going to work. So 
Now, if you remove the suffix, I, I argue to you that that made it clearer. Like the map was adding nothing. I mean, as I say here, if users isn't descriptive enough, then calling it users map is probably not going to solve whatever problem there was. Um, and, interest, and interestingly, c c consider the case of users map versus user map. Um, d d d depending on the local parlance, like you, you may remove the plural. Like, but if we then remove the word map, which the reader is going to do because they just transpose, like, they're like, yeah, I know it's a map. I'm just going to ignore that bit. One is a map of users. So clearly it's going to be users, users key to users. Another one just becomes user. So is that properties about a user or is it properties about a map of users? It's not clear from looking at the variable. This advice also applies to function parameters. Um, for example, naming the parameter config is sort of redundant because the type is config. We know it's a config. It, said, it just said there, right there. So maybe you might call it conf or C if the lifetime is very, very short. Um, if there's more than one config in scope, So, so, so sometimes you start, with a, you start with a function and then you add some more parameters over time or it grows, grows somebody more, more over time. Like say it was copying the configuration or mutating the configuration. Calling them conf1 and conf2, they only differ by one character at the end. Consti consider instead calling like original and updated. So like that which describes, this was the original, I copied from it. Updated, this is where I went. And that there's, there's a tip here which is probably uh, maybe go specific, but important nonetheless, which is don't let package names steal good variable names. When I import, when I import the context package, the word context is declared at the package scope. I, I cannot, uh, I, to, to redeclare it becomes very difficult. And this is why this is why when you see the context.context, context, it's usually called CTX, because context, the word, is already taken. Um, the database SQL package, um, might be SQL database, I think probably the other way around. The, re the, reason, uh, the reason that it was called SQL, database slash SQL, not the other way around, is you would be importing the database package, which means you could not have a variable called database. That was one of the, that was one of the main reasons for switching, switching those around. And as I said, a, a good name should be predictable. The reader should be able to understand the use of the name the first time they encounter it. Like, like your names should be, should be descriptive. And when they encounter a common name, they should be able to assume that, well, this has probably not changed its meaning since the last time I saw it. So a good name should be familiar. When you see DB, you know you're talking about a database. When you see SQL or trans, you, your TXN, you know you're talking about some kind of transaction. So be consistent in the names that you use to describe things because that consistency builds familiarity. So ra rather than like D sometimes and DBase and capital DB sometimes um, and database, just be consistent. Always use DB, whether it's in a uh, parameter, return value, a local declaration, even potentially the receiver. And there is, there is, a, there is a tension here. Um, the, con the convention for short receiver names is, is, a, is you know, normally we call a receiver a single letter or at most one or two letters taken from, from the type. Um, this, is, this is a case of just the local star, the local idiom. Um, just like the use of camel case, which you use camel case rather than snake case. It's just how we do it in Go. 
And it's also important to remember that outside of Go, in the wider world of programming, there are some variables which have traditional name, which, which have traditional uses. Um, I, J, and K come from Fortran. In Fortran, the letters I, let, variables starting with the letters I through N, the first two characters in the word integer, were integers. Everything else was, everything else was afloat. Um, so they, they're usually used for simple loops. Um, v v is, shom, is, is common shorthand for a value when you have a generic kind of function. K for key. A and B are, all, are usually used for generic, generic names for two things that you're going to compare. When you have a max function, you'll always pass in an, an A or an B. So again, this is, this is the local style. This helps not just the local style, but the general style. This helps programmers become familiar and easier to read your code because they're not, con they're not constantly asking, well, is I being used for a loop or is I being used for something else? Uh, it, ju it just helps familiarity. So Go has at least six different ways to declare a variable. Um, now that doesn't include the receiver. It doesn't include the parameters. It doesn't include named return variables. And there are probably some others that I haven't thought of. Um, in fact, one that it's not a variable, but imports is another, another way that you can declare an identifier. Um, this is definitely something that Go's designers recognized was probably a mistake, but uh, it's too late to change it now. And they argue probably correctly, in fact, I agree with them, that the bigger problem is shadowing. Um, like getting like a, a, a holy war about this is not as important as detecting shadowing, shadowing mistakes. But with all those different permutations, if we were to all break to our own corners and randomly choose our own, uh, our own, our own rules, that reduces readability. Because again, it's not familiar. So I want to present to you the, the, the kind of guideline that I follow. Um, and I'll, 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 I'll try and justify it to you. Um, may, maybe, maybe you'll find it useful. So the, the fundamental underlying thing here is that in Go, each variable has a purpose. It has to because they have to be used within the scope they were declared. You can't declare it way up there and not use it. Um, and declaring something at a global and then using it at a local is also very, very difficult. So when you see a variable, your first question is, well, what does it do? What is it here for? And so that's the question we should answer for the reader. So this is the style I use. So when declaring but not initializing, so use var. So that is, we're letting the value have its default zero value. So here, players is zero. Var uh, things, which is a slice of things, is an empty slice. It's actually a nil slice. And thing is an, empt is an empty thing variable, not a pointer to an empty thing value, not a pointer to a value. Now, the opposite is when you're declaring and initializing, so you're declaring it and giving it an initial value, the style I use is the colon equals style. And this is because we want to make it explicit to the reader that we are not choosing the zero value. I declare, I declared this variable because I intend to give it this value. So to try and justify this, this position, let's take the original And this time we're going to deliberately initialize each variable. So players int equals zero, things is nil, and var thing is a new thing. Now, immediately after we do this, the uh, the way that the way that the Go syntax works, and that the fact that there are no automatic conversions, only type inference, the type on the left hand side can be inferred from the right-hand side. So immediately we can simplify that 
just down to this. Like players was an int, the default, the, the default for an, uh, a numeric type is an int. And so this leads, leaves us with the explicitly initializing players to zero, um, which is redundant because zero is the type zero value. So it's better to be clear that we're choosing explicitly to be zero rather than why are they setting the thing to zero when it's already zero. So what about the second syntax? We can't elide the type. We can't write var things equals nil. This is because nil in this context does not have a type. Instead, we have to choose what do we want the zero value for this slice to be. Do we want it to be uh, the zero value for a slice, which is a nil? Or do we want to create a slice with zero elements? If we wanted the latter, that is not the zero value for a slice. The zero value for a slice is nil. This is actually explicitly initializing the slice to point to an array with no elements. So given that, we want to make it clear to the reader that we deliberately did this. We want to say to the reader, yes, I actually wanted a thing with no elements. So the style that I follow, we make it clear by using colon equals. It says we deliberately chose to do this. And so that brings us to the third declaration. Var thing equals new thing, which is both explicitly initializing the variable and uses the uncommon use of new. Um, now, some Go programmers dislike new. They get very upset. There is a lot of duplication between new and taking the address of a compact literal. They get very upset that there, is, there appear to be two ways to do the same thing. However, there is, there is a difference. This is declaring a new thing and letting all the, all the values inside thing be their, their zero value, which itself is the zero value for a thing. So we're making a new thing, explicitly asking for its default values, and then taking a pointer to it. That's a lot to say. That, that, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of conceptual overhead to say, just give me, just give me the thing. And fundamentally, what we're actually saying is this. Declare a new thing and pass its address to unmarshal. So even though it took two lines, this is much, much clearer of the intent. Now, as with all guidelines, there are always, always places where if you followed the rules like a stickler, you would make the readability worse. You, um, like you, 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 you teach your children, follow the laws, don't speed. But if, if, some, if someone's having a baby in a hospital, you drive real fast. So there are cases where, where sometimes, with justification, you, 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 you bend the rules. And an example of this is if we followed the style that I just dictated, you would end up with something like this, var min int, because we want the minimum to be zero, and we want the maximum to be a thousand. But that looks super weird. Like, we have two variables which are closely related, minimum and maximum, declared in, in different styles. One of them has, it, one has been, ex kind of falls to the zero value, the other is explicitly declared. So, I think we can argue that this is much, much clearer what I intended. And the other one is, th this, this is something that comes up, uh, I think Brian Kernigan writes this frequently, which is make, when something is being complicated, when something is tricky, make it obvious that it's tricky. Like, um, very rarely do you need to use uh, unsigned types, especially the correct sized unsigned type. But when you're dealing with network stuff or syscalls, they have very strong alignment requirements. And so this break, breaks the rule. The, the, the rule is if I'm giving it a, 
an actual va value, then I should use the colon equal syntax. But if we look at the colon uh, equal syntax version of it, length equals colon equals u int 32 of some number. Someone could be, equ could be asked, could equally un assume, well, why is that? Why is that constant being cast to a UN32? Like, what's, what's, so, what's so special about that? The, the, the prior syntax says that we're explicitly declaring length to be of this type. Whereas someone down here could be like, well, I don't understand why this is UN32 and just remove that cast. So again, it's just sometimes break the rules. And cinematographers do this all the time. Break the rules when they want to draw your attention to something because it looks unusual. Um, in, in horror movies, they generally will remove frames of movement. So uh, the, the, the spooky character or the evil character will move unnaturally because uh, the human reptilian brain is hardwired that things which move smoothly are probably part of your, your flock or your pack or your, your herd. Things which move erratically um, could be a predator. So cinematographers break the rules by making the character move unnaturally to draw your attention to it and actually make you afraid. So make tricky things stand out. And lastly, in this, in this section, um, software engineering is a team sport. You're most, you're most likely to spend most of your career working on software which you're not the sole author. You're going to have to collaborate on other people and they, they are going to have to come in and collaborate on your projects. So if you come into a project and the local style is somehow not how you like it, um, and we're much luckier in, um, in Go than, than in other languages because of the absolute dominance of GoFormed. There is no, uh, the, the, the rejection of GoFormat is also almost reject programming in Go. So we're very, very lucky that even if you do find some source code which is unformatted, almost by the time you open it in your editor, some tool is reformatted it for you. But even still, there, are, there may be differences in styles, uh, in the naming of variables. And my advice, my advice there is the uniformity, even if it may not be the, the preferred style that you have, is more important than the code that you added has one style, the code that somebody else has another style. That detracts from the readability because it is jarring to constantly flip between these. So, if you're, not the, if you're not the first one to touch the file, follow, follow the, the footsteps of the person who did. And of course, lastly, if you just cannot stand it at all and you must re do a mass reformatting of your code base, please don't smuggle those in with other changes. Like it, it, it is the worst to do a git bisect of a 5,000 line diff just because someone changed white space. Change don't mix your formatting changes with actual functional changes. Okay. Um, I'm kind of on a roll, but I do want to do want to make this this interactive. If, there, if you have questions, please put up your hand. If you have, um, if you want to refute anything I'm saying, please, please, I really want your feedback. We might do uh, one more. One more section, and we'll see how we're going for time. I, lo I love this quote from, um, from Dave Thomas. Good code has lots of comments. Bad code requires lots of comments. Um, Dave, Dave Thomas gave a presentation last year at Yao where he talked about his, his way for writing code. And the first thing he does is writes the comment of the function. And that's good style. You should, I mean, if you're... It, if, if you like, it, then, then your function has, has a comment already before you started writing it. But the reason he does that is he's writing himself a map for what he's going to do. And it's, it's not simply that you think about what you're going to write before, think about the code you're going to write. He looks out for, con for conjunctions like and and comma. And so when he writes a function that says, the such and such will connect to the database, comma, and update the, up update the user record, he sees that as a red flag. Because now he knows that function is doing two things. So, what he, so he uses that as a, as a clue to himself that this function does two things. What I should actually be writing is two functions. One that, one that 
uh, gets the record, and the second one that is past the record and does some changing of its state. Then maybe you go back and you, you write the first function, because at some point somebody has to join that business logic together, but it's better that they are independent actions joined, joined together rather than multiple different, multiple different pieces of functionality in one function. So comments, are, comments are, um, can be used as a really powerful, powerful tool. But I argue to you that um, there are actually different styles of comments. They're, they're, they do different things. Um, the, th the three that I can think of are a comment that explains what the thing does. That's, that's your, your commentary on public symbols. You, know, you said what this function does. That's, that's your Go doc. That's your method documentation. The second, uh, second one is to explain how something does. And that, this, the formatting's messed up there. I'll fix that in a second. But the comment should explain how the thing does what it does. Now, you don't want to expose that to the user. That's not part of your documentation because you shouldn't document the implementation. You should document the behavior. But inside, you, if it's a complicated method, you may have some um, exemplary text that says, this, uh, this is what we're going to do. We have to do these things in this order because of another, another condition. And the last one, the comment to explain why a thing is it is, I think is the most important part of, um, part of a comment. Now, it doesn't displace GoDog documentation. It doesn't displace some in, in, internal notes about how the function does what it does. But this is, it comes down to documenting the, the business rules that led to this code. Um, and that these are usually non-code factors. This, this comes from um, a piece of code inside, inside my product where we discovered that by default, Envoy, if you don't supply this, uh, you have to wait for 50% of the backends to report a failure before they report a failure. It's the most um, default behavior. So of course, we have to change this default behavior. We have to explicitly set the healthy panic threshold. Um, and so this, this comment does two things. It gives a clue to the reader. Why, why is this, like, why am I, like, surely zero should be the default. We have to explain to the reader that no, no, no. By default, it chooses something very bizarre. And also, we, we, we give a clue to where you can go and find out more. So yes, links to issues, design documents, RFCs. It, it's, it's not the place to write the entire history of the issue here, but you want to give enough of a crib note that somebody else can find and follow the breadcrumbs. Um, GitHub issues are perfect. Like the, 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 amount, the amount of code that you know, has you know, comment, you know, see issue, da, 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 for workaround. Comments on variables and constants should describe their contents, not their purpose. It's a little contradictory there. <laughs> yes, should, should describe the variable's contents, not its purpose. I'll need to improve the wording there. So for example, Random number equals six. If anybody, if anybody remembers the XKCD joke, determined from a roll of an unbiased die. It doesn't. We don't describe here why ra we, we describe why random number is given six, but we don't say what it's for. We don't say how it's going to be used, and this is deliberate. This is a public symbol. Random number can be referenced by many, many packages. Packages we don't know. Packages that haven't been written yet. So how can we possibly document how somebody else is going to use this number? Instead, we explain the name of the constant should be a guide for, uh, for potential users. Like, you're unlikely to use a variable called random number when you actually wanted a fixed number or a specific value. Like, it's kind of the clue is right there in its name. This is also important for uh, bringing in semantic context from that 
is bigger than is bigger than your program. So for example, 100 is just a number. You can count from 1 to 100, but in the context of HTTP, when two things that are talking HTTP talk, say the number 100 to each other, they mean status continue. So, give a clue to the reader where you where where you decided that 100 means status continue by you know, referencing, the, uh, referencing the spec or the RFC, that gives a person the clue of why this is 100. And if perhaps they get a bug that thinks, maybe there's a mistake in that table, they can go to the, the RFC and say, oh, I did transpose that wrong. So for a variable without an initial value, the comment should describe who's responsible for it. This is pretty much, uh, th th this is getting really into terrible design smell territory. We have a, a variable deep in the bowels of the Go compiler called size calculation disabled. It's a, it's a, a global variable. And there is a comment, which unfortunately has been cut off, I'll fix that, um, that describes that there is another function called do with. Actually, I'll just find that. So the, act, the actual comment in the, the code says, uh, indicates whether it's safe to do a certain thing, and it's C do with. It says do with is responsible for this, this variable. Let me show you something cool. Fixed. So. When you, when you see this, like the, 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 there are already enough design smells in here that you should be feeling quite nervous here. Like, like why, why is, is, is a function responsible for maintaining the, a global state? Like, shouldn't they, they're intimately entwined. Like, the only person who should be touching this is this function called do with. So the only person who should be able to touch it, we should put them into an object or something like that. There's a really big, big clue when you need to write a comment like this that you have an underlying design problem. Kate Gregory has uh, this fantastic observation that sometimes, dang it, I know exactly what's going on. Sometimes the better name for your variable is actually hiding right in that comment. Like, someone called it registry. Is it a bridal registry? Is it the registry of, of motor vehicles? No, it's a registry of SQL drivers. If you just call it SQL drivers, then it's very clear what it, what it contains. And also, you don't need to comment anymore. What's in here? There are SQL drivers. Um, Hopefully this goes without saying, you should always document your public symbols. Um, you should put a comment on everything that uh, is a public variable, constant, function, method, all those things. This, com uh, this recommendation comes from the Google Style Guide. This is not a, I think this is actually their Bash Style Guide. But they have, they have two rules. Any public function which is not both obvious and short. So, Possibly the only thing that would fit into that would be something like max. Like a three, if it's longer than three lines, you probably need to give a comment on it. And any function in a library must be, must, must be uh, commented regardless of length or complexity. So that's basically saying, if your code is going to be used by somebody else, you need to put a comment on it. And that's just, that's just good style. Let me just quickly check. Because ASCII.consider considers slash slash to be the there we go. Consider slash slash to be the comment whether it's inside a code block or not. There we go. Okay. 
Now there is one exception to this rule. You don't, I argue, that you don't need to document methods that implement an interface. Specifically, don't do this. Read implements the reader interface. That says nothing. The only thing that can happen to that comment is it can get out of date. I want to show you how the, how the IO package deals with this. So we have a limit reader, which is a reader. The, the, the limit reader function is a constructor. Limited reader reads from da da da, it returns, it, des it describes all the behavior of a reading type thing. And then immediately following it is a type called read. We know it's a reader. We've said it about eight times just before you hit that. What interface does this implement? Probably reader. Um, it's a little bit contextual. Um, and it, it, is, it is slightly odd that limited reader is a public type. I think if this, was, if this class was being, if this package was being designed today, that would, given that you have a constructor for it, that would probably not be exported, which again means that this function without a comment is not going to show up in GoDoc. But the, 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 the takeaway is don't, don't take this, the, the stipulation that you must comment everything that is public because it just leads you into doing things like this, which add no value. Um, Brian Kearney, don't comment bad code, just rewrite it. Um, I, I, I have um, some, some comments written out of frustration in, in, in my product. Uh, there's one particularly dealing with Glog. Glog must be initialized in a particular way and I, when someone fixed, fixed this, I demanded the PR include a very salty comment of just how upset I was that we had to do this rubbish. Um, but the, the, the more grown up way is, if you encounter like a comment that says, this is broken, we should do a better way, you need, it, like, it's not sufficient that it's just there in the code. You need to take action to register that technical debt and make a plan to fix it. Um, in, in Go, the, the, the predominant style is this to-do style. Like I know if you're coming from Python, it's XXX. I don't know what Ruby style is. Uh, I think Java has a, uh, an annotation, but only on um, Javadoc, only on the, the method. Um, but the, the, the predominant style we do here is the word to-do, and actually there are tools that look for that. Um, the putting your username or some identifier of like who you are in the brackets is not saying, I'm going to fix this. Um, it is when somebody else comes across it, say, they want to know more context. Like, like, what were you thinking that you didn't have time to do? Well, I can ask Dave about that. Um, this is an OK comment. A better one is to say, we should fix this, and a link to the issue. So you can say, b b b because comments get out of date. If you link to an issue and you go to GitHub and find that that issue's been closed, you can, you can uh, delete that comment. So don't, it's not simply enough just to like write out of frustration, this could be better, we could do better. Link it to some actual, uh, some actual way of improving. So to-dos and pointing to issues are a great way of doing it. And the last one to close on uh, is this observation that do you need, do you need to comment everything? Like, like, like comments that just describe exactly what's going to happen next add no value. More importantly, can you write, th th this probably describes for the second class of commentary, the one inside that describes how a method does what it does. Um, if you can improve the code through break extracting the method, through giving them better names, maybe you, you, can, you can remove the textual description of what it does, which has, to be in, uh, which has to be in sync with the code that it's describing. If you can make the code self-describing, then removing the comment is even better. And of course, one of the best ways to do that is extract method. What are we doing on time? Do we have any questions? Is there anything anybody wants to vehemently disagree with or agree with? Um, um. Yeah, 
Oh, we had two. Okay. You were first because I was looking at you. Then I'll come to you. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, they are approaching a new, uh, new problem. But they don't know. But so, leaving is sort of like the last thing that you want to think about. Do you, so, should we think about it maybe first? Or should we come up with like a prototype hmm. landing first? Okay, so the, 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 the question is, naming can sometimes be hard, especially when you're exploring with code. Um, you, 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 may, you may disagree with this, but the, the way that I think about software development is that what happens on my machine, uh, you know, like, is, you know, like, like that, that's right, you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. What happens on my machine before I push a PR stays on my machine. Um, I gen, generally, I you know when, when, when I push a branch, I'm looking at like look. Let's look at the diff. Can I improve the diff? So I don't focus. I don't focus when I'm writing the code. What I focus on is getting the tests at that point. But when it comes to actually pushing the change to uh, pushing the change to GitHub, that's when I look and say, Can I make this smaller? Can I make this cleaner? Is there any, is there any is there any duplication that I can remove from that? And you may you may want to. Um, one of the other ways when I'm implementing a big feature is that I'll just write whatever it takes to get it done, and then that's in a branch, and then I start to peel off bits of those branches and clean them up as I go along too. So I don't work in an incremental fashion. I get the thing working, but then as I'm trying to feed it into the code base, I peel off bits. And that's probably the case where I'll say, is this name descriptive? Because you're, instead of a 500 line diff, you're working with little units of 60 or 70. And that, that's more tractable and, and more incremental. Um, yes? Uh, you were talking about uh, simplicity of code, value, uh, observability, or the views on what's in this case. Yes. You can imagine creating those 50 lines of code mm. and one goal for the same, but uh, making it more simple is like kind of extract the methods and another one would say that I'm going to be complex to your functions. How do you find it? So, the, 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 the question is simplicity is subjective. Yeah. Um, and that, that is, that is the, the big fundamental underlying problem of all of this. Like, we, like there is no, I mean, R R Rich Hickey has a, a very, he, he goes back to the dictionary and de defines simplicity from uh, its root, which is simplex, which is one, singular. Um, whereas, Complex comes from complex, which means to bind and, and uh, inter interweave. Um, so you, you, you can approach it from that point of view. Like that, that's that's why ideas like extract method mean you do one thing, you do one thing, and you do another thing, and then the one thing is to combine the, the two of those. Um, but you, you, you're right that taken to the taken to the extreme, you have methods that do one that do with methods with very descriptive name that do very little. The, the, the code becomes overwhelming. It's my 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 answer to you is that this is an agreement, but but between your team. Like if somebody says that is too complex, I can't understand it. They're part of the group as well. If um, you, you you have to reach reach an equal an, an equilibrium. Um, one, one way for, di one way for uh, dealing with that is the idea of hiding complexity. Okay, if this algorithm is very complex, then we're going to put it in its own package with its own set of tests and with its own um, API. And then for everybody else who needs to interact with it rather than maintain it, their, their interactions with it are much, uh, are much simpler. So th those, are some, those are some suggestions. But I, I do agree that fundamentally, there, apart from a dictionary def definition of Simplicity, which is hard to, um, which is hard to internalize. Um, th 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 this is a process of, well, this this is what this this workshop is. It's it's me sharing with you my experiences and the way that I try and think about this problem. I yeah, go for it, Bill. Let me share three thoughts. An encapsulation should define a an abstraction where one is absolutely precise. Right? No reason to define a function that isn't precise about the behavior it's supposed to exhibit. Now you're writing generic function. Every abstraction should define a new semantic behavior that is precise. Put that in your head. Oh, for, the recording. for the recording. So you hear, you hear what I just said, right? 
every abstraction, every function should define a new semantic or behavior that is precise. It's obvious on what it's providing. Now readability for me means not hiding the cost of what that code is doing. You should be able to look at every line of code and understand the cost of that. All right? And I'm not talking performance costs so much, but we understand what it's going to do. We also understand the behavior. We're not hiding anything. This is why when Dave says, well, simplicity is fighting readability because simplicity is about hiding complexity. So you're not allowed to hide complexity if you lose readability. You're not allowed to have it. And that's a subjective again for your team, right? The average developer on your team should be able to understand the entire code base you're working on and all of the mental models around it. So for me, it's subjective to the team. But if I see somebody writing a function that is not precise or in, in what it does, red flag. If their answer was, well, I did that because I wanted to abstract seven lines of boilerplate code that I have to keep copying and pasting, I say, but you're having to find a really a new semantic here. We're now losing readability because I could have just put the seven lines of code everywhere it was. And I fully understand when I get to that piece of the code what it, what it means. But no, now you've abstracted it around something because you didn't want to copy and paste it seven times. So for me, you write a piece of code, you get it working, you do a readability review of that code immediately. Are we following our design philosophies? Are, is everything in line for where we are right now on readability, not hiding cost? Does everybody on the team understand this? Simplicity, which to me is you have to discover simplicity, by the way. You can't design for it. You discover it once you've got working code bases. Go is brilliant around simplicity. It abstracts garbage, it, it, it abstracts all the m machine from you, but you can look at any line of code and know what's gonna allocate, right? You don't have to, but you can. Scheduling is completely you know, hidden from you, right? But, it, but it's not really in terms of cost. Go can do this over and over and over again, it's amazing, but it's discovered, it's not designed. So those are my thoughts on that. Thank you. Um, so, okay. What, looking at the time, what we might do is do one more section, then we'll take a, we'll take a break, um, come back. So I've kind of been working from the small up to the, the larger. And so now, now we've had names, comments, functions. Now we're kind of at... Um, package design because fundamentally I think I think of the package as the unit of deliverable in Go not not anything else um, in his in his book test driven design Kent Beck describes this idea of a unit of software um, and the unit in almost a physics term is um, is indivisible um, it's the it's it's the smallest amount that you can observe so for a long for a long time for a long time in, uh, in, in physics, we didn't even know about the subatomic particles. I mean, we, we, we now know that atoms are composed of quarks and bosons and fermions and other things like that, but we can't observe them directly. Like the, the, way, the, the way that they observed these was shooting beams of, uh, beams of electrons through an atom and inferring from the way that the, uh, the electrons were scattered what was happening. You can't observe them directly, you can just um, infer. So if a unit is in software is composed of smaller so-called subatomic particles, as the caller of the software, somewhere from outside that package, we can't directly observe them, or I'm going to make that stronger and say we should not be able to directly observe them. Because fundamentally, what we're observing would be implementation details. Instead, what we want is to rely only on the behavior of that unit. Now, the size of the unit of software differs, um, differs by language. In C, the unit is probably the function, because in C, you don't actually have anything but functions. You have macros, which are just text editing. In Java, um, the unit of common uh, software is commonly misbelieved to be the class. Um, there's, there's, a great, there's a great talk by uh, Ian Cooper, who it's, it's called TDD, where, where Did It All Go Wrong? And it talks about 
how in, in, in the Java world, the predominant style has been one test class, one class, one test class. But in Go, the unit of software, I argue to you, isn't the function or the method or the type, it's the package. Because looking from outside as an observer of the package, someone observing it through its behavior, we can't see into the package. We can only see the public API. The public API the package describes what it does, not how it does it. Um, a well-designed package should do that. And equally, your public API should try not to leak implementation details, either via types or via some kind of observable behavior of like the ordering of things or any, any of those things. So I'm going to talk in the section more about how to how to do these things, like how to, how to create what I think is a good package. And fundamentally, the goal of a package is to provide a set of behaviors. Writing a good package like, fundamentally starts with its name. Um, a, a, a kind of common retort that I like to use to people is to say that the name of your package is your kind of one word elevator pitch. It's that story that you get in an elevator, you have, tw you have 12 seconds to pitch a, a prominent um, a Silicon Valley venture capitalist who's right next to you in the elevator. When the doors open, they get to their floor, you missed, you missed your boat. In this sentence, you have one word to describe what your package is going to do for them to, to sell it. And fundamentally, if, your one, if you choose your one word to be utils, or common, or base, you've kind of blown it. So just like I talked about the naming of variables, the naming of packages are very important. The name should, should say, what is the purpose of this package? What services will I get when I use this package? What is it going to do for me? The name shouldn't describe how it's going to do that. And it certainly shouldn't, shouldn't describe what is inside the package. That's useless. Um, equally, inside your project, each package um, should be unique. I, I say should, I mean there's no must in any of this, but they, they, they should be unique because you shouldn't have two packages providing the same thing. Like if, if your package name uh, is, is descriptive of what it provides, then you shouldn't have that functionality sprayed across multiple packages. Um, and if you find you have two packages with the same name, it's likely either that the package name is too, too generic and not descriptive. Um, client, worker, shared, uh, I mean, they, they are names, but they, like, if there's a client, there's probably a server package right next to it. If there's a worker, there's probably a manager somewhere. If they're shared, there's probably also a private. So a name which needs a twin or needs a, needs a partner is not a descriptive name. Now, if you find a package overlaps with another, um, if you can, consider merging them. Or in cases where like these are utilities or things like that that don't belong in this, give them a more descriptive name. And the, the two examples I point to are IO slash IO util and HTTP, HTTP util, which are groupings of utilities. Um, uh, if, if, if we were to design them again, perhaps they wouldn't be in the standard library. But the key is that it's not IO slash util, because that would make the name of the package util, which is neither descriptive nor unique, because that would also mean we have a net slash HTTP slash util. So sticking the boot into utility packages, um, these are where kind of utility or helper code just kind of congeals over time. And because these packages are assortment, uh, you know, kind of mixed assortments of, uh, of unrelated functions, their utility is hard to describe in terms of what it provides. Think about when you go to the supermarket and you buy, um, I, I can go to the supermarket and buy a bag of mixed lollies. That's because it doesn't provide or contain only jelly babies or any of those little kind of 
strawberry cream things. It contains a mixture, so its name is mixed lollies. That's all you can say about it. Um, and packages, in my experience, like the utils and the helper packages, tend to um, grow inside large projects when people overuse, overuse other packages. And generally those packages, the utils and the commons and the shareds and the bases grow because somebody's had to break an import loop by moving some of that code outside. Because the name of the package is derived from its, its function, its function is to break this import loop. It doesn't have a really good name because its name is not, not driven by what it provides. It's driven simply by the need to break this import loop. Um, my, my recommendation, I mean, try very hard to, to not have utility packages and certainly try not to have a utility library. That is the worst. I'll, I'll get into exactly why that is in a second. Because fundamentally, a, a little duplication, like having the same helper function a few times, is fine. It's private. I mean, if you, if you move it out of a utility function into the place that it's called, it no longer needs to be exported. And if it's not exported, it's not part of your public API. You have a lot more flexibility to change it, to remove it, to refactor it when it's not part of actually the code that you're committing to support. Um, using plurals is good for naming, naming util utility packages. I mean, there are examples in the standard library, like the strings package that provides everything you need to know about strings. Um, it's not called string, it's called strings. Now, to give, to give some examples of this, in, I'll, I'll take Java because I have a good background in that. Because of Java's uh, elaborate package hierarchy and the fact that you can have many different access mod modifiers, it is very common that you'll have a package for the client, package for the server, and a package called common, which is the common bits in between it. In Go, let's take our HTTP package. We have a file called client. We have a file called server. And the common types between them go into an idea called transport, which is the, the kind of RFC message transport in both directions. And it's, it's important to remember, again, thinking from the consumer of your package, that the name of your package, in, sorry, the name of your, your symbol, like your function or your type, includes the name of the package. So what you think is get inside you're working in your HTTP library, everybody else knows is HTTP.get. It's pretty descriptive. Um, strings.reader is strings.reader. Um, and the error interface type defined in the net package, when other people refer to it, it is net.error. So you have that facility that if you give your package a good name, it amplifies the names of the types inside it. Um, there, there, there are certainly examples of getting this wrong in the standard library. Hash.hash .hash is terrible. It's terrible. Like, like that, that says nothing, but it says it twice. But we have, uh, we, we have much, uh, much more powerful examples, which is io.reader, which has become fundamental to the way that people think about io in Go. Now, because we don't have uh, exceptions for control flow in Go, there's no requirement to put the successful code inside, indented inside the try block. Instead, the predominant style in Go is guard clauses, a bunch of preconditions and re early returns from them, which means as you go down the function, you know that successfully more and more checks have been passed. And this also means that the success case lives on the, lives on the left-hand side of the code. It doesn't disappear up into the right. So Matt, Matt Ryer um, talks a lot about this. He calls it line of sight coding. And the idea is that it doesn't disappear off out of sight from the screen. So to give an example of, give an example of this, this is um, I just picked this from the, from the uh, bytes package because it kind of proves, 
proves my point, which uses the kind of guard clause style. We have a check at the top. Then we do, we do some behavior here. I think there might be a little bit missing from there. And then we, we, have, the, we have the return behavior. So we know that... Is this going to work? Probably. We know once we get to this point here, that last read is greater than, the, greater than op invalid. So we know that precondition holds for the rest of the function. Let's have a look if I rewrote it in a kind of where the success case is nested inside. First of all, we have to turn op invalid, to turn that condition around. And then now it's not clear to the reader. There are now two returns. There's one here. There's one down here. So we need to read the entire body of the function to know, are we going to exit from here or are we going to exit from here? Also, you can imagine if this was a more complicated function, the risk of this logic nesting inside itself, rolling off to the right, is much bigger. And the thing is that, to, as I said, to figure out which return case, you have to count the braces. This is, I think, one of the fundamental reasons why we prefer the guard clause style. Another one, this is, this, I think this is almost a proverb. Make the zero value useful. Because every value that's declared, if you don't initialize it, you get the zero value. And this, this is important not just for safety and correctness. We don't have un uninitialized memory in Go. But importantly, if Go programmers internalize this facility, it can make the code a lot, e it can make the code a lot easier to write and therefore a lot easier to read. Now, an example of this, sync.mutex uh, contains two unexported integer fields. Um, they represent the mutex's internal state. And thanks to the magic of the zero value, they get given the values zero um, when a mutex is declared. We don't need a constructor for that. We just arrange the code such that zero is the unlocked state. This means any time, even embedded or even as a field inside another type, you can just declare it like that. You, you can imagine if to use a mutex you had to call sync.newMutex and then assign that to, if you imagine this was star sync.mutex, that this type, my int, was not safe unless you'd done that extra value. It would force two things on you. One, you would probably have a constructor for that. And so you have more constructors and more constructors you have literally just to initialize memory. And the second one is that whenever you see a my int, you don't know if it's been correctly initialized. Like if, it gets, if a reference that gets passed in, you don't know whether someone knew to correctly assign a, a mutex to it. And I, I, I picked this example because I do pick this up a lot in code review. That whenever I see a pointer to a mutex, that is a huge, that is a huge red flag. It's not to say it's not, uh, it's never, it's never correct, but that is a, a, a case where you are sharing a lock between, uh, be between two different vari values. And that, um, I've never seen that successfully done. That is always a mistake. We, we, we do this all the time with byte stop buffer. You don't need to, uh, call bytes.newbuffer, um, uh, you can just use a bytes buffer straight away. It implements an interface straight away. Um, it works just as you would. You don't need to explicitly initialize it. A, a useful property of slices is, again, they have really useful zero value. The slice struct in the runtime has two fields, length and capacity. And the zero value for those is going to be zero. So by default, a slice, even if it points, no, no matter what memory that's pointing to, um, a length of zero and a capacity of zero means that the first thing you do with it uh, to append with it is going to properly initialize it.
I, sh I should mention that slices have, uh, it is possible to tell the difference between an empty, uh, an initialized slice of no elements and a, a, a nil slice. Um, reflect deep equal, equal can spot this, but really you, you shouldn't structure your code that it needs to know the difference between is this string nil or is this string, is this slice nil or is it uh, have zero, have, have zero elements. You can use the length property on both of them, and if you build your code around that, then you can be much more flexible with strings, with slices constructed either way. And the opposite is true as well. Um, it's a somewhat surprising property, but initialized pointers, you can call methods on them. Um, and so this can be an interesting way of providing default values. So we have, we have a config. Um, in, in, in the case C1 is not initialized, it's a, it points to nil. So, we're going to, so we can check for that nil in there and provide a default value. So you, you, th th this, this is a way um, of con uh, creating configuration structs that uh, if values haven't been given to them, they can respond with a, with a sensible default. All right, this is the last one, then we'll take, we'll take a break. I don't know whether you're setting up or cleaning up. Um, and the key to writing maintainable, program, maintainable programs and maintainable packages in this case is that they should be loosely coupled. A change to one package should have a low probability of affecting another. And there are two excellent ways of ensuring that this is true. First one is use interfaces when communicating between packages. The caller should describe the behavior, the, should describe the behavior it wants by, by using an interface rather than, uh, rather than specific, specifying a concrete type. And the other one is avoid global state. Um, in, Glo in Go, we can declare variables at the block, at the function level, um, method scope. We can also do it at package scope. And this is what I mean by global scope. Because if we make that variable public, then its scope is effectively global to the entire program. Anybody that knows the name of that variable can change it, and they can observe changes to it. And what this means is that global variables become invisible parameters to every single function and method that you write. Because the, the body of that function method can change its behavior based on some global state. We, we, we saw an example of that do with function earlier. That its, its behavior will change and the rest of the compiler will change based on that, the state of Something, something disabled. So now that's weird enough as it is, but this also has uh, implications for maintainability. Any function that re re relies on a global variable will cease to compile if you change the type of that variable. It's public, you don't know who's depending on it, and if you change the type of it, it will, uh, it will fail to compile. And of course, any function that relies on the state of that variable can be broken if another part changes it incorrectly. If you have, if you have functions that are coordinating themselves through, share, through a shared global variable, um, it's very hard to contain their state. It's very hard to know if you found all the places that mutate that. So if you want to reduce coupling, move your relevant variables into fields on structs as you need them. That also means that instead of having one of these states in the entire program, it's now encapsulated in, in, a, in a type, in an object. And therefore, anyone who previously referred to the global state just needs a reference to your instance of it. And as I said, use interfaces to reduce the coupling between, uh, between packages because interfaces let you talk about the behavior, not how that behavior is implemented. So, I think we should take a break for 15 minutes. Uh, yeah, 15 minutes will, get, will keep us on time. 15, 20 minutes. And then we'll come back, uh, we'll talk about some more about Go. The so 
So now that we've talked about a package singular, let's talk about the real, the real name of the game, which is combining packages together into projects, either libraries or your application. I want to point out that um, I use the word I use the word project, but given with Go 1.13 coming up um, and the the use of Go modules, a module and a project are pretty interchangeable. Like, like a module has a very specific meaning. It is the thing defined by Go.mod. A project is the, the the name I give to a Git repository with some Go source code in it, which is pretty much how we think of uh, a Go project. Um, the same as a package, I argue to you that each project should have a clear purpose. Now, if your project is a library, like it should try, its goal should be to do one thing. Um, let's say if it's like XML parsing or logging, it shouldn't, all, like your logging library shouldn't also include an XML parser. And your XML parser shouldn't also include a JSON parser. Like you should, you, you should be clear what your project does by having, giving it a, a, a common goal. And the, re the, reason, the, the reason I say this is that I really want to dissuade you from this idea of a common library. Um, to, to, to just check my understanding, when I, when I say a common library, I mean you have a project that's been going on for some time, and you start a second project, and then someone has the idea that, oh, th this, this functionality, we need to share it between them. And so very quickly you arrive at a library, not which does XML parsing or a logging library, but one that follows the same idea. It's common code we want to share behind it, but the only thing is, is this sharing, that the, the purpose is ill-defined. It's just a bag of helpers and features. Have, have people come across that in projects that they work on? One, two, come on. Yeah, it's a bit more like it. So for those who haven't, um, I'm going to say that you're lucky because I've also worked on projects like this. And there is not just the, the kind of common is a bad name for things. The more important thing is that the common repository, its evolution is tied to its largest consumer. So if you have, in my example with uh, when I worked on Juju at Canonical, we took most of the things we thought would be common, would be useful, that we'd written in Juju, and we pulled them out into a common, common library, which meant that they were, they were separate in separate repositories, but they, live, they were conceptually the same. Any change to, we needed to Juju, we had to change in the common library first, and then we used that functionality there. So the, the common library and its biggest consumer are tied closely. Now that means that the smaller consumers get the rough end of the stick. They, they're, they're usually encouraged to put common helper code into this common library, but fundamentally they may have to wait for a long time for it to be upgraded, or worse, they may be force upgrade and be broken because, because the big project pulls them along. Now, th and this, this also became much more insidious when it became backports. Um, obviously, if you, uh, when I worked for Canonical, we had to maintain four different releases of every software, one for every, that we do the release every six months. So we had, at any one time, we had four versions of our product, the one that shipped in the four different versions of Ubuntu. This meant that we also had to have four different versions of the common library, obviously, because they're tied together. Now, the, pro the problem there is to backport a fix to, uh, in, into, pre into older versions of the product, that fix usually involves changing the common library, which means you need to rev, which means you need to upgrade, like you, you land the chick fix into the common library, and you, you then need, you then make that new dependency the one you're going to use in the old version. And that generally tends to break things because as well as the one change that you needed in the common library, there's all the other things that have happened the last 18 months. So you end up having to backport in both your library and your project. And this kind of totally undid the notion of the utility of sharing this code because every supported version of the product had also a version of the common library as well. They were clearly linked together. We just chose them to bifurcate them 
because we thought we were future-proofing ourselves. So my suggestion to you to, to work around these problems is don't have a common repository. If, um, for example, in our common it had everything from mock time through to testing helpers, every, every possible thing you can imagine. Each of those should be their own project. They should have the separate repository, version, version them independently. That means you can upgrade them and when you need a fix to one of them, you are much smaller surface area you're changing. One of the other things I tend to pick up in code review of programmers who've transitioned from other languages, um, languages with a, with a well-defined project stru um, package structure, is that they tend to overuse packages. Um, now, I, I, th I think the truth for all of us as Go programmers is that, uh, that, the, that the, the path to mastery of Go is really the path to being moderate in use of all your features, not just packages, but channels, Go routines, uh, interfaces, being moderate in all these features is something that, with experience, you realize that's, that's actually the way to go. Um, but package overuse specifically seems to be one of the common, the common ones that show up. Um, and that there's, there's some reasons why this is probably not, a, probably not a good idea, like why you can't bring the way you used to organize your code in Java over to Go. And one of those reasons is that we don't have this very elaborate um, visibility system. Java, for example, has public protected, private and default um, access modifiers. They also apply to the class as well as the method. There's a lot of different ways of saying, this person over here I identify very clearly can access, uh, can access this field, but this person in, to my right is not allowed to do. In Go, obviously, we only have public and private. Either you can get to it, either everyone can get to it, or no one can get to it. There is, there, is one, um, there is one exception to that, and I'll come to that very soon. So given that we have this paucity of access controls, how, what practices, what guidelines should we, should we follow to avoid making overcomplicated package hierarchies? And the advice that I find myself repeating the most is to prefer, when all, when all things are considered, prefer fewer but larger packages. You saw, you saw an example earlier where I said, we don't have a HTTP slash client and a HTTP slash server and a HTTP slash common. The purpose of the HTTP package is to provide all things HTTP. So this, you bring all those together. Um, another, another way of implicitly following, following this guideline is to say, Every package, with the exception of command and internal, should contain some source code. If you find yourself creating a package hierarchy to, be, to create a very detailed taxonomy, where you put things, you, you put things in smaller and smaller directories, uh, and thus those intermediate, intermediate directories are empty, it's only the one at the end that has source code, that's a clue that you might be overusing packages. Um, an, an, an example of this is the package directory, which seems to have kind of leaked out and infected other big Go projects. And it's really, a, really a, a, an aspect of history that uh, was just incidental. Um, because, of the, because of the original way that we built Go code um, using make files, we needed to put all the source code in a particular directory so we could have a recursive uh, make build. And so the very first versions of Go shipped had a directory called command, which obviously had the commands in it, and a directory called package, which had everything else. Um, years ago, the standard library moved away from this because uh, we just didn't need it. Like, like it, was, uh, it, was out of, uh, it was out of sync with how Go path worked. This was this weird oddity in Go root, had this extra slash package in there. And also we didn't need it because the Go tool um, was much more effective at building code than, than recursive make. So my, my argument to you is that the package is just like putting I in front of interfaces, needless boilerplate. It adds nothing other than noise. And the replacement for that I'm going to talk about next, which is the internal directory. Um, this advice, I just re reiterated that. So 
So next thing, if we're arranging our packages by what they provide to the caller, what about the files inside them? Like the, the names of the files and how many that you have are not obvious to the, not, uh, not obvious to the consumer. They're completely, once the thing is compiled, they're completely erased. But are there any guidelines which will help, which will help new readers navigate through our source code? And so these are, these are the guidelines that, that I follow. That I've, I've been doing these for more than five years now. I, I, think, I think they're, they're pretty solid. Um, start, start simply. New directory, one file. End, end with go. Um, maybe give it the same name as the folder. Like that's a, that's a, a good default. Like if you chose a good package name, you, you, do, you, don't need to, oh, you don't need to overthink it and reinvest in making just reuse the package name as the name of the source code file. Um, it, it does seem to be a little bit of duplication that the HTTP package also has a file called HTTP, also in the directory name HTTP, but given that you can't change two of those things, like why, why invent, invest the mental energy in thinking up a fancy name for the package, for the, for the source code file? Now, as your package grows, you're probably going to find that either just you don't like how long the file is getting, or you, 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 you feel that you want a different arrangement to help logically, um, split the source code into different files by their responsibility. So that this, when I said earlier, think of, think of a package in Java as a source code file in Go. Um, that this is an implementation of that. So uh, if, you have, uh, if you have a messages file, so this is for some kind of uh, RPC protocol, messages.go contains things about requests and responses. Clients contains the kind of client, client code, and server contains the server type. Another pattern which uh, either supersedes or overlays with this one is to arrange files by your import declarations. Now you'll find that you probably have uh, some common imports across all your files. IO and FUMPT are usually good examples of this. But generally, you can find files, you can find the code which is doing network stuff and isolate that so you, so you only have one file that imports the net dependency. That means only network stuff happens in that. It can't happen in any other file because you haven't imported the net package. And similarly, if you have stuff that does parsing, uh, perhaps you know, decoding, decoding, the, de 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 decoding the messages from the response from the client to the server, you probably want to put those in a different file. So again, uh, so again, you, you split up the responsibility very simply by the, the imports in which they include, because they ultimately define what's going to happen inside that, that file. Um, nouns are a really good uh, name for source code files. Um, files are, after all, containers for code. So they should contain, they should be nouns. We call it we, 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 container is a noun. Uh, bookcase is a noun. Uh, the, 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 the nouns are very good for source code. Um, if, if, if you're concerned that um, splitting a file into many will affect your compile time, please don't worry about that. Effectively, when, when the source code is presented to the Go compiler, the Go compiler compiles each function in parallel, or at least parallel being the number of CPUs you have, it, not per file. So splitting up by file will neither increase nor decrease your compilation time. Um, as I talked about, there is, there is no implicit hierarchy, with one exception, of packages. Net HCP is not a child of the net package. This is just, this is just a, a weak taxonomy. There is no relationship between them other than just where the source code is stored. And to, to get back to the, 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 the first piece of advice, which was avoid um, large sets of blank intermediary directories, if you find you're doing that, you might have fallen afoul of, of a desire to create a taxonomy. Like, like, like when, when you classify things, you create a classification, then the next thing to do is create subclassifications and be even more specific and even more specific. And that's um, interesting work, but fundamentally not where the value lies. All you're going to do is just have longer import 
statements for no real value. Okay, so as I alluded to a few times, we have the internal package. Who, who knows what I'm talking about when I say the internal package? Yep, Jacob knows. Everybody else does not. Okay. So, so Go code as we understand it today. If it's public, anyone in the world can import it. Anyone can go get your package and depend on your little utility parsing function four, la four layers deep that you never actually intended to be part of your public API. But given that we only have exported and unexported, Go doesn't, doesn't appear to give us any way of saying, this is helper functionality only for my project. Please don't depend on it. That's exactly what the, what the internal directory is for. The Go tool recognizes this special folder name, not a package name. And so it's not enough to call it package internal. The, the name of the folder or directory has to be internal. And this, this can be used to indicate code that is public to that part of your project, or usually your whole project, but is not public to the rest of the world. So it's a way of scoping the public symbols that you have and saying they're not part of my public API. You cannot depend on them. You cannot import them. Um, to create an internal package, so-called, stick it inside a directory called internal. Who can import it then? Only direct uh, ancestors. Um, it's, it's, easier to, it's easier to show in text rather than to try and describe it. The rules are quite, um, it's a simple rule, but it's quite verbose. Simply, if we have ABC internal DEF, only code that is rooted at ABC and downwards from there can import uh, ABC slash internal anything. So AB, ABG, DEF, all of those roots uh, effectively represent uh, other packages from other parts of GitHub. And they're not, the Go tool will not, prov not compile, it will not let you uh, compile uh, an, an import that you are not a direct sibling of. So what, what, this, what this means fundamentally is you can create internal packages with good descriptive names that provide a set of functionality. And you can also say that you can also limit who can depend on them. And that's super critical because everything in your public API is public. People will depend on it whether you ask them to or not. Um, when, when the internal directory was being proposed, um, I argued strenuously that this should just be a convention. It shouldn't be a. Uh, it, it shouldn't be enforced by the Go compiler. It shouldn't. Um, the Go tool shouldn't know anything about this. If somebody does this intentionally, it's right there in the name. You know, like it's instead of internal, call it don't import. And if you import the thing called don't import, well then it's on you. Um, I can categorically say that I was wrong. This. It has to be enforced because otherwise, otherwise there is no there is no way that you can avoid getting an issue on your on your GitHub repository two years after the fact, saying someone like, "I was using your internal hash function. You deleted it on me, man." Um, you don't want to be in that position. You want, by default, everything that you publish in your package to be private, and you want to very selectively, when you choose, rather than the rather than the semantics of language choosing to make it available to other people. I mean, publishing, uh, if you have some code which has grown in an internal package, making it public is as simple as just moving it up one directory, one directory. That's all it takes. And then, but that's a deliberate action that you take rather than letting it just kind of fall out of writing the code. Um, are there any, seeing, seeing as few people put up their hands about the internal package, are there any questions about that, I could probably show examples if you want. Yes? Uh, sometimes I come across situations of circular dependency between packages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my question is, how, how is this situation handled in the standard library like net HTTP? They don't refer each other? Correct. Um, the, 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 the question is about circular dependencies, um, how to break them when they happen. And my belief, I mean, the, the, the Go tool does not permit circular dependencies. Java does, I'm pretty sure C Sharp does, I have no idea. I don't believe uh, Ruby or Python does, but that's kind of a, um, the way that their languages work. JavaScript, I'm not sure. 
Um, but to make the language simpler, to make the compilation easier, Go tool does not allow circular dependencies. Now, where do they come from, and why, why are you affected by them? My assertion to you is that circular dependencies come from having too many packages. When, when you get into the situation that A depends on B and B depends on A, your only solution is to create a, C, a third package and move the things that they need from each other into that one. And you, you've just made the problem worse. Now you have three packages where you, where you two, and that program just, that problem balloons from there. Circular dependencies are a design issue. They're not a limitation in the language, they're a fundamental design issue. If I depend on, if, if, I, if I need to ask you for permission and you also need to ask me for permission, neither of us can get anything done. It's a, it's a design issue that shows up when the Go, when the Go tool won't compile your, your source code. Um, so we should talk more, but the, the, the simple answer to that is when I, when people say I have the circular dependency between these two, the instinctual response is I can break this by just moving the code out. The real response is that you should look at the design and say why why are, they, why are they so tightly coupled that they need to talk to each other? Why is the dependency tree in bi-directional? It needs to be, needs to be one direction. So it's a, it's, a, it's a symptom of a design issue. But we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk later at the end. Because, because I, I, know it's, I know it's simple for me to say, oh, you just need to merge, the, merge those two packages. But I'm making a very difficult situation seem simple. Um, the, la the last point. Um, is the last piece of advice is your package main, your command, your function, the thing that holds your main.main should do as little as possible. And this is because main.main um, is very special. Obviously, it's where the main entry point into, but it has a bunch of properties that make it uh, especially very difficult to test and at both a function level and a package level. For example, you cannot import package main. You cannot import it into another package. So you cannot use any of the functions in that main package. You, you, you might have some helpers for like checking errors or loading config files. You cannot reuse them anywhere else because main cannot be imported, any, a, a main package cannot be imported anywhere else. Um, also, main is effectively a singleton. There can only be one main function in a program. And you also can't call that main function from anywhere else, don't forget. It's lowercase m, so it's not public. You can't call it from anywhere else. And because it has this singleton behavior, there are a lot of assumptions that are just baked into it. Um, the first one is that it will only be called at the, initial, at the start of your program. Um, it, it will only be called once. It makes it very hard to write tests for your main function or any code called directly from your main function in that package because of those first two rules. They only expect to be called once and it can't be called from anywhere else. Um, main packages do a lot of other behavior which is implicit. Any, uh, this is the main function for my project. This, uh, this is, is only expected, like, like what, what are the cases where this will be initialized? It's going to be initialized by some code that's run from main. So that makes it super difficult to write a test about because that initialization will only happen once, so I can have exactly one test case. That sucks. Um, main packages either directly through the main function or through kind of helpers that they call generally expect to parse command line flags, which are again are a singleton. They expect files to be on disk. Um, it's, it's, it's not uncommon to hard code a config file. That's going to make it super hard to test, especially if you want to test the parsing of that config file for di different values of that config file in parallel. It's going to be very, very hard to test. So given all these limitations, my advice is that you should aim to move as much of that business logic Everything except for just parsing, um, parsing your command line flags. Um, you don't. You maybe don't need to write a test for that, test for that if you use a command line parsing library. Like, why do you need to test what what some, what Cobra has been tested or uh, or Kingpin has tested? Like, you, you you can you can pretty much assume that the actual reading and parsing of flags is probably going to work because that's been well tested. 
So really, you want to read your, parse your flags, open any like major connections, like set up your logger, open your connection to Kubernetes or your database or whatever the main things that your program cannot possibly continue without, and then take all that state and pass it to some other package which has got the business logic. Um, you want to move as much as possible out of your main package because it's just a pain to test. Okay, th this, isn't, this isn't the last point, but it is the last area of design advice that we're going to talk about today. We're going to move on to some other, some other aspects like error handling and testing next. But of all the suggestions that I've made so far, I think these, they really are suggestions because fundamentally, with the possible exception of the name you give to public things, all of that is just like implementation details. You can refactor that, you can fight about it in code view, you can move source code between files, you can move them in and out of different packages. It's probably not going to be visible to the user. But for me, when it comes to reviewing APIs, public APIs, this is, this is where I put all my energy into the code review. We don't, we don't waste time talking about names or arguing about indentation or stuff like that. I put all my effort into reviewing the public API because that's the only thing that matters for the caller. They can't see any of the rest of it. Now, why, now is, is this just like a personal vendetta that I just really give people a hard time about their public API? I think it's, I think it's justifiable because changing a public API forces your user base to have to dedicate engineering resources to following your change. If, you, if they want to upgrade to the new version of your library and their code doesn't compile, the first thing they're going to do is roll back. And, if they, and depending on the, the size of the break, the larger that break is, the more likely it is that that's going to be pushed off to like, work that you should do later. Um, it's, it's fundamentally like, if I've just arbitrarily decided to rename things in my API, that's a low impact change. Like no function, they get no new functionality from upgrading to my new version, but it has a high risk. They have to change their code. And this, this then creates the worst scenario that you have users using old versions of your software. And that this, this entire model of I can, I can check a fix into my project on master and release a new version breaks because you have people using older versions. And the, the longer they stay on those older versions, the more dedicated they get to them. They demand backports. I'm not going to say Python 2.7, but that's what I mean. Your superpower is that you get to ship those, fe those fixes quickly. And you can only do that if the upgrades are as painless as possible for your users. If they're, um, if the, if they're even slightly difficult, what, what was previously a, a simple change to a dependency management file becomes a ticket with a t-shirt size in an engineering backlog that just won't get done. So you can't get your APIs right the first time. The more, the bigger that you make them, the bigger the chance that you'll have something you want to change. But it really pays to put your engineering effort into thinking very clearly about both the, the behavior that you want to promise and the unintended behavior that's leaking out. And I've got some examples. I love this. Josh Block is the tech lead, if he was, I, um, Brian Getz is now, the tech lead for Java for a long time. And the, the, the summary of this entire section is really this. APIs should be easy to use and hard to misuse. Hard to misuse is kind of obvious. Like, like we, we, we don't want to make it easy for people to do the wrong thing. But the easy to use bit is the one that seems to trip people up. They seem to mistake flexibility, the ability to do a lot, for ease of use, which is the ability to do the, the common thing, the default thing, easily without prevarication. Okay. 
So here, here, are some, here are some examples of how you can, how you can mess yourself up. Here are two, two functions. They're very short. They have very simple, simple APIs. One is very easy to use. The other, uh, you have a 50% chance of getting it right. What's the difference between these two functions? Um, well, obviously, one tells you the maximum of two numbers. The other one copies files around. Now, the thing about max is that if I say, what is, what is, what is larger? $1 or $10 is exactly the same question as what is larger, $10 or $1. It's commutative. The order does not matter. So in that case, it's OK for those two parameters to be the same, because it doesn't matter if, if I ask, as I say, what is the maximum of 8 and 10? What's 10? What is the maximum of 10 and 8? It's also 10. Let's compare it to the copy file example. Can you tell which is the right way to do it? Which one of these statements made a backup of your presentation? And which one overwrote your presentation with last week's backup? You couldn't even tell in code review. Unless you were intimately burnt by this constantly, you would not remember the order of the parameters. The, the usual way that it works in Go comes ironically from the way it works in assembly, which is the uh, register closest to the instruction is the target. But like, who's going to remember that? So the, the, the problem here is not that, that it wasn't well documented, like they're called to and from. The problem is that there is no, the compiler cannot help you, and there's no way that a code reviewer can know without consulting the documentation, did you get these parameters right? I mean, the, the general advice is don't do this. Like, try very hard to avoid it. Just like long parameter lists are a design smell, like if you have 7, 8, 15 parameters to a, a, a method, you know you've, done a, you know you've made a mistake. But lists of any size of indistinct parameters um, are also a design smell. Um, just as an exercise, I tried to find some way to fix this. And that's basically by defining a new type called a source. And that has a copy to method. So because, it, because it's kind as a string, we can say source is this, and then source copy to destination. It kind of, that's kind of a cute, fluent interface. But at least it, present, it prevents you from calling copy file incorrectly. And this also means that maybe copy file, we don't need to make it public anymore. We can hide its dangerous nature and say it has to be called through. Like copying a file is a, a useful function, but maybe we can hide the ambiguity of its to and from parameters by putting it behind some other kind of helpers and types. So fundamentally, APIs with multiple parameters of the same types are hard to use correctly. So in that example, all the, all the parameters were required. You have to, you have to, have, you have, to have a source and a destination. Then there, there is no default destination. There's no default source. But most APIs are targeted towards a range of callers, people who want from the, the most common behavior, which is the way that they're most commonly invoked, through to the most specialized behavior. And so a couple of years ago, I gave a talk about using this functional options pattern to make it easier to make APIs useful for their default case. It's basically a, me a mechanism of removing optional parameters. They don't show up in the parameter list. You're only required to supply the things that have no reasonable defaults. But the underlying, the, the underlying message from that talk was that you shouldn't require callers to give you parameters that they either don't know or don't care about. Um, so, many, so many APIs, public APIs I read, require you to pass in a variable which is only used in uncommon cases. Like, and all the places you see it copied, that'll just be a zero or something like that. So because you need to supply that parameter, the users have guessed. They're like, well, I don't know what it is, so what is, what is like a reasonable default? Well, zero? OK, zero. Work, that's fine. OK, we're going, we're going on. 
And the thing is, because they're guessing, if they're lucky, it has no impact. Like if they guessed right, it has no impact. If later on, the, that parameter which they thought was unimportant suddenly becomes very, very important, they're now explicitly saying zero, which might, zero might be don't copy anything. So they can't, they can't tell because the behavior of the method has changed and the signature say, stayed the same. Um, so you, 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 can, you can read the talk there, watch it there. I'm not going to re reiterate it there. But the, 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 the takeaway is this is the thing that I pick up on in design reviews the most. Every parameter must be justified. Like the, it, they really have to pay for themselves many, many times over. Um, if you have a parameter which is optional, I will push the, I'll push the author to make a second, a second type of function call you know, with such and such parameter, with such and such parameter. Because if that is the unusual case, like if most of the time you want the default behavior, then save the name, like the, the short name of this function with the default behavior and the least number of parameters for the one that they expect. If occasionally you have to pass it with an extra style or pass it with a formatting parameter or pass it with a width, call it function with width, and that has the extra parameter. Under the hood, they probably dispatch to a private method which does all the, th the stuff, but you don't expose that complexity to the user directly. So let's um, give an example. And a a as I said, it's, I, I, I usually use examples from the standard library mainly because um, to the most extent, they're blameless. Um, many, many people have touched this code. Many, many people have reviewed it. It's not a personal statement on any engineer. Um, the HTTP package um, is tremendously successful. And the success has mean that it has grown via process of extension and accretion over time. And that makes it really good for these case studies of what happens to packages over time as they grow. Like how do seemingly inconsequential things actually, or as we'll see in this example, well-intended things actually turn out to be bad ideas. So how many people know this listen and serve method? You've probably called it like in like hello world, um, hello world on HTTP examples. You call net.listen and serve, you give it some address, colon 8080, and you either pass nil for the default handler or you pass in your own handler. Like it's, you can write a hello world that publishes on the web in a, in a few in a few minutes. Um, so this would seem to be a tremendously successful API. Um, you, you, you can you can write a hello world in four or five lines. So what is it? What is there to pick on in here? It takes two parameters, the address, and a handler, which is the the root of your router, the, your routing tree. Now. Serve also has a second parameter, um, which is the router if you want, or if you pass nil, it will use this thing called default serve mux, which is a public variable inside the HTTP package. So he here, coming back to what Dave Thomas said earlier, you now have a situation where this thing does two things. It listens and serves, and if you haven't given it a HTTP handler, it will do some different behavior. So what this means is you can call it like this, or you can call it like that, and it does exactly the same thing. So that's weird. I mean, the, you, you have what is an optional parameter. So this, this is an exa example of an optional parameter. But it turns out that if you actually don't know what the value for the optional parameter is, then listen and serve will, will implicitly use default serve marks. And the reason, the reason this nil is here is actually viral. It comes from uh, HTTP.serve. So listen and serve is just a helper that wraps listen and serve, I'm just writing this name. So the nil comes from the fact that serve, if you pass nil into it, will actually use default, uh, default, default serve mux. But, You might be forgiven for thinking, well, I can pass nil in the right parameter, so why can't I pass nil in the left parameter? Like nil means in the second position means use the default. But if I pass nil in the left position, it panics. 
fact, just gives you an ugly panic. So the, pro the, 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 the problem is that we, we kind of suggested, and many of the examples that you see online say, nil goes in the left-hand column. So you could be forgiven for thinking, well, nil, goes, nil means default. I just want you to list someone on localhost. I guess that's the default. Pass nil for that. So the, the takeaway is don't mix nil and non nilable parameters in the function signature. I mean, I'm, I'm going to argue later, don't ever pass nil at all. But certainly, if some of the parameters permit nil and others don't, don't mix them together. Either everything allows a nil or nothing does. Now, what the author of Listen and Serve was trying to do is make your life easier. Like, like these eight lines that you have to remember, I mean, there, there are more than, there's, there's more than just typing them in. You have to know it's TCP. You have to know the value of that. Listen, you need to pass the word TCP to it. You need to, you need to remember to close um, the listener. Um, and and the, the defer is kind of special because you need to know that serve actually blocks. So they, they are doing a little, bit of, a little bit of work for you. They were trying to do the right thing. But really, there's no difference between these three lines and these three lines, except that there are two ways to do it. Like, this saves nothing. This is, a, this is already a public variable. The, 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 the nil just encourages people to, to say, I don't know. I don't know what that value should be. Let's try nil. And was this really actually, does default serve marks really help? It's only saving one line. So th th these, are, these are the kind of discussions I'll have in code review, where people are trying to make their, their API friendly, but they they get ahead of themselves in thinking, well, how, how would I like to write this in the most concise way? And they miss the fact that they are making their API more, more ambiguous, and this admits unintended behavior. Um, this, yes? Yeah? Correct. Yeah. So the, the, the question is, what, what if what if your argument is the inter, uh, is an interface type? Well, you, nil nil kind of satisfies by that. It's more. Th this is probably perhaps poorly worded. Um, I don't mean nilable as in nil fits in a in a pointer type where it doesn't fit in a value type. I mean, don't mix fields which are permitted to be nil with fields which are not permitted to be nil. Um, but I'm, I'm going to argue strenuously just. Don't ever pass nil for, for a parameter. It's just always the wrong answer. Um, and, and another place that this, that this shows up is in um, public API with test-only parameters. Um, th th these are things like uh, if your thing does something with the network or if your thing like, writes to a database, uh, it's, it's tempting to have a parameter to say, uh, you know, don't actually touch the database. So, right, so th there'll be a, like somewhere in there some kind of parameter like false or you know, per, per, you know, read only or something like that that is really only used in a test context. Um, if that's the case, make that, you take that function, make it private, and have, have two callers. One, one which passes the please, please rewrite in the main code and in the, test, in the test function, have a different version of it that passes false. So if, if there's something about your API that makes it um, hard to mock your downstream dependency and you actually have to have a, a kind of uh, safeguard inside the code itself to say, don't, please don't actually commit these transactions while I'm trying to run my tests because that'll mess up my fixtures, don't expose that to your users in any way. And you'll, you'll, see, those, uh, you'll see these show up really, really easily because all of the invocations of a particular API in main code, in your real code, will have one value for that magic don't write parameter, and in your tests, it'll always have a different one. The value of that, the value of that um, magic parameter that says, please don't write, please don't write this data back to the database, or please read. Uh, th think of doing mirror traffic. You want to read the res you want to read the request and process it, but you don't want to send the response back because the main server's actually done that. You, you can easily spot those in your test code uh, because 
in the tests, it's always in one direction, and in the main code, it's always in the opposite direction. So that's a real smell of parameters which affect the testing that should never be exposed to the user. Another, another one that shows up a lot um, is when you need to pass several of things. Um, this, this is a, a, a semi-made up example, um, but it's, ba it's based on code that we worked on that did a lot of interactions with um, cloud APIs, and they always have lists of VMs to read or write or things like that. The thing is, what, while this will shut down n VMs in a single call, um, almost all the time it was called in code, and especially in the test code, we only ever passed one. So that meant that we had to, for that single value that we had, we had to wrap it in a slice just so we could pass it through the, pass it through the interface or pass it through the, the function parameter. And the second thing is that because this is a slice and you can pass nil or an empty slice, that gives you an extra thing you have to test. What if someone calls shutdown VM with no VMs? You, 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 can, you can easily write the code to deal with that, but it's another unintended consequence of exposing that API. I'll give you another example um, that I was recently working on. This is, it's, it's a little bit ugly because the names are long, but effectively the logic boiled down to this. If max connection is greater than zero, or max requests, or max pending requests, so if one of these four parameters was non-zero. Now you can imagine how this function grew. It started with max connections, and then as we added max requests, and then so it grew slowly over time to the right. And it, it also doesn't really tell us what, what we're doing. I mean, th these are relatively well named. So a reading, of, a reading of this, like you read it two or three times, you're like, oh, it's the individual logic is not important. Like the values of max requests or max connections are not important. It's simply the fact that one of them is positive. So what we actually want to do is extract that logic. We want to call it, we can make a little helper like this that says, that says, if any of these values, and we just range over them, um, is greater than zero, then we say, yes, one of them is positive. And we can refactor the function like this. It's still, it's still a bit long. I mean, maybe you could break it into multiple lines or something like that. But it's a little bit clear. Like, like it reads like English. If any of these are positive, then do this behavior. But because because we made this variadic, you can call it with none. You can call it with no arguments. And in the case of the code above, it would return false because you get no iterations through that loop. Um, so this isn't the worst thing in the world, but it's kind of like, like a nonsens nonsensical question. What is the maximum of no numbers? You don't know that you, that, that you can't compute that. So we want to make it so that this helper function, any positive, can never be called with less than one value. A, a, a little bit more code in the helper. We just deal with first, and then we deal with the rest. And that means that you can't write this function with less than one parameter. It's first and then rest. The next one um, goes to, I, I talked a lot about defining behavior in terms of interfaces. And this is, this is an example of it. Let's say we've been given a task to, so we have this document, who knows what kind of document it is, but we've given, been given the task to write itself um, to disk. So we want to serialize the, the document to disk. Um, and so I sit down at my editor and I come up with this. And I say, we had a method called save and you pass in the file you want it to save to. OK, that, that gets the job done, but it, it presents a set of problems. The first one is that the signature of save must go to a file, because that's the only thing that can be an os.file. You can, if you're very, very clever, get a Unix path. But realistically, 
the first thing that's going to happen is someone say, well, can I write this to the network? Or can I, can I, keep this, can I write this out to memory because I want to test it? And because of that, save is really difficult to test because to validate that its operation worked, you have to poop a file out on disk. So you have to create a temporary file, pass it to save, call save, and then read the file back and compare it to what you wanted. Sorry, I, I won't say it's going to poop a file anymore. That's Sorry, Jacob. Um, so that, that's just annoying, that you, you have to create temporary files, and you have to make sure they're cleaned up, and you have to make sure that they're not written concurrently, and all those things. But moreover, OS.file has a lot of methods that aren't really relevant to save. Like, it's, it's the representation of a Unix file descriptor. So it can do things like, you can ask it, is this file a symlink? Or if this file represents a directory, give me the directory entries. And these are not things that save should be responsible for doing or actually capable of doing. So what is the go way to, to kind of solve this? We can change the signature of save to be an interface. And this, uh, this solves both of those problems. The first thing that rather than uh, passing a concrete file, we say, you must pass me something that is a read-write closer, which is the relevant things that filey things can do. Um, this means that save can be used anywhere that you have a read-write closer. Um, and it also means that save no longer has the option to call those methods on files, like reading directories and symlinks and changing permissions, which means that we know it can't do those things. Because we, all we've said to you is you can read, and you can write, and you can close. Now, if we take this idea further, well, why does save need to read? Like, like if, if save was verifying the file that it wrote out, it might, it might do that, but then it's not really, it shouldn't be called save. It could, should be called save and verify or something like that. So we can keep restricting the scope of save down by removing things from the interface that we give it. Um, we, we take off the permission to read, and therefore we guarantee that it can't read what it just wrote, because it shouldn't need to. That should be a different, a different function. Now, what about the close behavior? Close, uh, close presents a lot, of, a, a, a lot of ambiguity, because if we're saying save has the ability to close the thing we passed into it, when next, the next question is, well, when is it going to do that? That's something that you can only really specify in documentation. You, can, you might have to say it's very complicated logic of save will close the file unless there was an error or blah, blah, blah. But if save closes the file on success, then that means I can't use, I, I can't use the writer that I passed into save to write anything else out, out afterwards, which means I can't like, use it for streaming data on the network, because as soon as I use it once, it's going to close the network connection. So again, we want to keep making the interface we pass down to save smaller. We want to remove save. We could, we could do a bunch of shenanigans with, uh, with, with an interface. Uh, like, like we could create a kind of no-op closer that when you call close, it doesn't actually close. But that's, um, that's, that, that's we, we, we can do it easier if we just say save doesn't get a write, write closer, it just gets a writer. So the writer, we now know that save can do nothing but just write data to this stream. It doesn't know anything about where that stream is. It could be a network, it could be a bytes buffer, it could be a file, it could be anywhere. And so by pying what turns out to be the interface segregation principle. We've made a, a function that's the most specific in what it wants to do. It only gets to write things. It, it says it right there in the method. It can't do anything else but write. Also, it's the most general. It can write to anything. And then once, once we've done this analysis, maybe it turns out that save isn't the right name. Maybe it should be write to. I don't know, that's just, a, that's just a, a throwaway thought that now it's not save to file, it's actually write to writer. Maybe, 
maybe that's a better name. Okay. Nil is absolutely fascinating. Um, it's something that something I think most people in Go either are scared of or they take for granted. They don't really um, re re really look too deeply into it. But nil is the most bizarre thing in the world. For example, you can't compare nil to itself. Both equal equality or inequality. Nil is not just not equal to itself in the way that NAN is not equal to itself. Literally, you can't write that code. That will not compile. It's, even though we always use error not equal to nil, you can't write nil not equal to nil. It, just, it, it, it does not support those operators. Yet, bizarrely, nil can appear on either side of a binary operation. You can say if error equals nil or if nil equals error. It's the most bizarre thing. So given all these restrictions, like, like why the hell would we have nil in Go? And this is something that um, people coming from a functional background are very upset that Go has this concept of nilness, it seems, um, a a as an affront. Um, my my in interpretation of that is mainly coming from other languages, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call out Java here, that overuses nil. People are terrified of nil pointer exceptions in Java because they happen all the time. And the reason they happen all the time is that in Java you use nil for a failure condition. The thing worked, or I gave you back an it. I gave you back a nil, and we'll see an example of that in a little bit. But nil has a lot of a, a lot of good use cases. Like, if you assign nil to a pointer, the pointer won't point to anything. Like, you you need a way of saying of disconnecting a pointer, of saying this memory is no longer referenced. You need a concept like that. If you assign nil to an interface, the interface won't point to anything. Um, same with you point to a slice, you free that slice. You need, you need this concept. Under the hood, nil's meaning, or its type, is determined from the, uh, from the other parts of the expression. So for example, when we say, f equals nil, that actual nil is coerced into a OS file that points to nothing. The same nil later on, we say the string equals nil, it's coerced into a, a, a slice of string thing. So nil has a very strong relationship with the zero value. But the main thing that trips up Go programmers is this awful thing called the type nil. Um, I've argued in the go to um, the, the, the go to discussions that we we should we should work to abolish the the type nil. I haven't got a lot of support in that, but I do need to tell, I need to explain what's happening here. So in this code, we don't check the error. That that's that's the actual problem. But the result is, if, there were, if that path was, if we open failed, we're ignoring the error, so the f we're going to give back is nil. Now the thing is, the type of f is an os.file. It's not a writer. os.open returns a star os.file. So that's going to be a nil os file. And so what is happening when you return f there, that nil, the nil OS file is being passed, boxed into a writer, so the type in the interface will be OS.file, and the value will be nil. And this is where this is where all goes terribly wrong because nil is a nil type and a nil nil pointer, and f is a OS.file type and a nil pointer. You can see just by that explanation they're not the same. Do I have an example there? I don't have an example there. But the, 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 the trick there is if you, are, if you have a concrete type, say, uh, I should probably actually rewrite that to be better. Um, in fact, let me rewrite it and you'll see exactly what I mean. Shall we in? The one before error handling. 
API design. Yes, 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 I know someone else has got it open, I don't care. God. Oh, my control master, my socket's gone to bed. Okay, this is much clearer. You can see that the value returned from os.open must be appointed to a file. It has to, to compile. So if that is nil, we have a nil os.file. That nil os.file is being boxed inside the, right, inside the interface. An interface is two words, the, name, the identifier for the type and the value. That's how type assertions work. It knows the interface holds a reference to the type that was put into it. And so back here, this is where the, the type nil comes from. And the simple answer to that is if you're ever in that situation, you mustn't, you, 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 you mu you mustn't return the value of f in the error condition. You must always return explicitly nil. I should have a better for error for that. I'll, I'll do an example at the end of this. I think I might actually have some better ones down here. But the, the, the sad truth is that we have to deal with type nils. Okay, we have two sections left. Um, error handling. It's really important. It's as important as the rest of your code. Um, it's as important as checking, checking the loop condition or, check, or checking a shift. Because fundamentally, it's not different type of coding. Fundamentally, it's just normal code, just like string manipulation or shifting. It's your responsibility. Why doesn't Go have exceptions? Um, exceptions obfuscate control flow. They're non-local return. When, it, when an exception happens, you can jump out of many, 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 many stack frames in one go. So they give you a different way of, of the, the CPU moving through the code. Reliable software cannot be written with unchecked exceptions. I make this statement because we have C++. In C++, you can have, they, if, if you watch any of the C++ conference talks, they, like, someone like Herb Sutter will get up on stage and he'll have, he'll have a simple thing like, like adding two strings together, like you know, A plus B. He'll, say, he'll, just, he'll look at the audience and he'll say, is this code safe? It's adding two strings together. And it turns out that no, because a custom implementation of a string could throw an exception in, a, in an uncaught copy constructor, all this nonsense in C++. Because uh, exceptions are not required to be de declared. Now, of course, Java came along and said, "Well, this is this is the big problem that um, I don't know by looking at your function if it's going to call some code that's going to throw an exception. So we're going to make everybody check their exceptions. If your thing throws an exception, you write it in the you write it in the function signature. Therefore, everybody knows that, and you're forced to check it." The problem with that is that that had terrible implications for uh, interfaces when, when, they came up, when they came along. You either have, if you implement an interface that has a throws clause in it, then you have to, you, 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 you must, you, you can both only use exceptions of the type that it says it throws, and you must only use exceptions of the type that it throws. The opposite is the uh, collections types, which do not throw in exceptions. Therefore, they say, the compiler says, these collections using them, like an iterator or a, a, an iterator or a range object, does not throw um, an exception. Which is great, except if you want to create an iterator over something like JSON data reading from a network, which could have a problem. So, 
I could rat hole on this for a long time, but the fact is no other language other than Java has implemented checked exceptions. I believe this to be true. Now, given that everyone usually agrees that unchecked exceptions are bad because you don't know if any code is going to call them, and nobody else has tried to use checked exceptions because of the, the problems that Java had with them, I defy you to come up with a reasonable, a reasonable for way, way for how exceptions can be used. They sound great on paper, but 25 years of practice in three different programming languages have shown that they're not. Now, in Go, we don't use exceptions. We have error values. We take advantage of the fact that we have multiple returns. This is a thing which, in the world of compiled languages, I would say um, around the time that Go was out, was almost unique. Um, you, you have, you have um, uh, tuples and things like that in Python, but because of most of the history of most of the compiled languages going back to C, which returned a value in the AX register, just a single register was part of the calling convention, almost all languages had only one return value. Now in Go, we have multiple returns, and so we have the facility to, make, to pass back a thing and an error value when necessary. I just want to talk a little bit about um, panic and recover and just kind of how weird they are. Because some people look at panic and say, well, that's just, that's just try and catch with just different names. But the panic and recover are so specialized and so weird, they're off in their own corner. So recover can only be used, like you can call panic anywhere you want. It does one thing, it, call, it cause, causes your program to, to attempt to unconditionally exit. It's fair enough, you can use panic anywhere you want, you can, it's a normal statement. But recover, you can only write recover in one place. You can only write recover inside a defer block. The compiler will not let you use that word anywhere else. And the only reason why you would use recover is to recover from a panic. So th th there's this bizarre pair of features which kind of live by themselves off in the end. You shouldn't look at them as saying, well, that's the natural error handling behavior. All these, this nonsense with multiple returns is just, that, that's just noise. The natural behavior is panic and recover. And that's just not true. They're not designed for that. A couple of years ago, Joe, Joe Tsai um, talked to GopherCon about um, this idea known as Hiram's Law, which is named after um, an ex-Googler called Hiram Wright, who noted that with a large enough user bases of, of your API, they will eventually come to depend on every possible aspect of that API, whether you intend it or not. And we've definitely seen that play out in, in Go over the last 10 years. And one of the ways that you can really blow yourself up on this when it comes to error handling is being is being too specific about the error you're going to return. So error is just an interface, but interfaces, every value, every value that implements an interface has a type. So the first thing you can do is you can say, is this a specific kind of error? Seem, seem, seems natural, like you, you have a very generic interface, uh, error interface, and you can type a cert and say, is this a network error? or a URL error. You can kind of try and look into it and say, I think you're going to give me one of these. And this is what happened, this is what happened in issue 2886. HTTP.get says in its documentation that you will return, it, it will always return types of URL uh, error, uh, net.url error, HTTP.url. Actually, I'm just going to open it. I can find my cursor. And the problem there is that meant that if the underlying, uh, the thing that the HTTP client was connected to returned a different error, we had to stuff that inside. So like a network error, we had to stuff that inside the URL error because we've been very specific and said, you will always get a, a type, an error of this type. We were not permitted from ever returning any other kind of error. And this caught us multiple times. We have to have a lot of testing around this to make sure that 
every single possible way that HTTP.get can return, returns this very specific error type for no good reason, other than we were just thought we were being helpful. A URL error um, includes both the underlying error and the URL you were trying to get to. We were trying to do the right thing, but by being too specific, we now could, no, could never change anything about the implementation of HTTP.get. So if you want to avoid things like that, my overriding advice is don't assume you know anything about the type of the error. Either the error is nil, in which case the call worked, or it is not nil, not equal to nil. That's all you know, the call failed. If you try and dig more into that, I know there are cases where uh, in database systems and in internal libraries, you do want to be more, more prescriptive about that. You're, being, you're very tightly coupling the implementation, which may be many, many layers of core layer down in many different packages. You're very tightly coupling yourself to that. So if you shouldn't check the type, what should you do? Um, what, one, one suggestion I have, and this is, um, this is very much an area that, that will change in Go 1.13 if the errors proposal lands. Um, I've been off the air for a little bit, and it's not clear if it actually is going to land. There's a sustained um, backlash from people who've seen the implementation in 1.13 and are not happy. They, they, want, they want more thinking about it. But So we'll just talk about the world, the world as it is today. There are a small number of cases where you can't just say, oh, the error wasn't nil. That's fine. It failed. I, that's all I know. There are a few cases where you need to... Uh, you, you need to know a little bit more. And one of those, for example, would be, is this a temporary error? Like, my, my client API is trying to call yours. <coughs> the cloud was down for a nanosecond. The call failed. You need, you need some way of saying, is this a temporary failure? Like, if I just try again, is that OK? Or is this a permanent failure? Now, whether you, you actually implement that at the edge of your behavior or as some kind of intermediary, like kind of retriable library in the middle, Something still, need, something still wants to check, is this a, was that a temporary error? And the, the suggestion that I have is communicate properties of your errors, not with the type, but with additional behaviors that they implement. For example, the uh, net.error type has a function called it, called timeout, which returns true if the, error ha if the error occurred because the other end timed out. And because of that, we can construct a, an, an interface in line and say, the error I was given, has someone put a timeout method on it? If it is, then we'll ask the timeout, we'll ask the timeout method, were you actually the timeout? And this means that you don't need to specify that the only thing passed into is timeout will be net.errors. Anything which has a timeout behavior on it can do. Now, this might seem quite short-sighted because you're saying, well, what are the, the, the possible range of type of behaviors, timeout, you know, uh, retriable error, like, like, like many, there could be many, many possible uh, behaviors to describe by this. But in practice, when we actually survey the Go code base, um, timeout and temporary cover almost the majority of the set. Like, like, when you're saying an error happened, but is it OK to try again, these two seem to suffice. So if you do declare your own error types, and this is not, this is not for every single possible package that you do, if it is temporary, stick a, stick a kind of a, a, a temporary method on there, and then you can write a helper where you need to check, and that's usually at the top of your Go routine, was that a temporary error? And you have, you know nothing about the type that's actually being used, you're just communicating via an interface. And I think, okay, there, there, there are two more here, but this, this comes back to what I, what I opened with, that using nil to indicate an error is a big design smell. Now let's give some background here. When Go programmers discover that you can call a method on a nil receiver, it generally blows their mind. Because they're used to Java with a virtual method, with a, v, with a v table pointer. 
sorry, C++ Ruby table pointer with Java where you can't call uh, a method on a nil reference. But in Go, in Go, calling uh, you know, bar.wo and calling wo with a bar is exactly the same. And in fact, under the hood, this is what a method is. We just take the receiver and we make an implicit first parameter. So while this might seem bizarre, like, whoa, I called a, I, 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 I called a method on a nil receiver, this is quite, this is fine. It's like, oh, I passed nil for, for whoa, but it didn't use the B parameter anyway, so that's not, that's not strange at all. So when you restate it like this, it's clear to see that passing nil for the receiver is uneventful. But where the problem arises, obviously, if you try and touch B, if you try and use some properties, and you're going to do that on methods because you wouldn't put that method on a, on a type unless you actually intended to use bits of that type. If, it didn't, if, the, if that method didn't reference its receiver in any way, it doesn't need to be a method, it's just a function. And th this, this is where, this is where it, um, people become unnerved. Because it's going to panic on this line. And it's going to say that the problem was here. Look, B was nil. That's why I crashed. But the actual programming error was here. It should report the error here. But, it, uh, but you don't get that error reported there. And the reason, the, the, the reason is that the programming error actually appeared right here. We didn't initialize bar. So when we tried to uh, dereference B to get the message, that's why it panicked. So the, the problem is not that Go allows, uh, allows you to call uh, methods with a nil receiver. It's the fact that we accidentally use nil in the first place. It's an interesting use of the spelling of the word grip, but OK. Um, so when, when Go programmers first come across this, just like when they come across the type nil, they grip with this, this panic that because this could happen, and there's no real protection inside, inside the language for it, this is going to happen all the time, and the code is going to be unreliable. So how would you defensively program against this? The first case is usually to put some kind of check inside the method. Like, oops, you know, you, you call, if, if bar is not nil, so you didn't accidentally pass nil for me, then I'll print out the message, and I'll make sure I can never crash by never dereferencing uh, deep referencing B if it's nil. But the real solution is to realize that that check should happen before you call that thing. And, the, and I'm going to make a case I, I'm, I'm going to make a case for why. And it's to, it's to do with when you're inside that method and you've been passed a nil receiver, what really are your are your choices? Well, the first one is if someone, if B is nil and we don't want to continue execution, we can panic and say, B is nil. You shouldn't have called me, called me with a nil receiver. But given that dereferencing that field anyway is going to panic anyway, apart from having a little more control over the panic message, this is, this is just needless ceremony. It's neither defensive programming, because you still panic, nor, uh, nor is it at really adding anything. So what about, what about if we said, well, this is Go. We have multiple returns. If, uh, if there's an error, like if we, we, we say that this is not a panic-worthy condition, this is just a programming error. So we say, if Bill is B equals nil, then we're going to return an error saying, hey, you called me with a nil, with a nil B. But this has serious, serious implications. If you're saying, well, this is the way that we're going to work forever from now on, this has serious impl implications. Every method, every method has to return an error just so that you could potentially report to the caller, whoops, you called me with nil. Every caller has to check that error after every single method. You, th you think people complain about Go's error handling now? Just wait till you have to check on every single method. Clearly, that's not workable. 
Worse, every interface you define will have to include an error parameter so that any implementation can do this behavior. And the opposite is that there are a bunch of interfaces already defined and already in use in the standard Go library which don't have this error parameter. So what are you going to do then? Like, like do you, are you going to be selective about when you check or are you just not going to use those interfaces? Like, this is not an answer. It's not practical. So we saw above that whoops is going to print nothing if there's a neural receiver. It's only going to execute, it's going to do a precondition, it's going to check, it's, it's going to check, is, is my receiver correct? Okay, then it's, it's okay, I can go and dereference message. So it's going to use that, that guard clause that we talked about earlier. And I argue to this is perhaps the worst choice of all. If those, the other two weren't bad enough, this is the worst choice. Because the operation will silently do nothing. Now imagine trying to debug a complex failure when just bits of your application don't run because you have nils leaking in places. So given there's a reasonable way for a method to execute against being called on a nil receiver, my, my case to you is just don't try. Because that's not actually the problem. The problem is where that nil came from. Don't try and fix it after the fact. It came from not checking an error. It's the, in the last six years of programming Go every day, this is ultimately where all those nils come from. Not checking the error. And we have, the good news is we have great tools for that. All the linters will check if you don't, if you don't um, check and handle an error. All you need to do is pass your, your code through GoToolVet and you'll never have this problem. And equally, you shouldn't write your method, your functions or anything to return nil as some kind of signifier for, uh, to, to return nil to say, oh, an error happened. Um, the, the most classic one in Java uh, is string, strings.substring. If you, sub, if, you make, if you ask for a substring that's out of range, let's like say you have a very small string and you're after the one five characters to the right, it returns nil. So you have this nil which is silently leaking around your code base until someone touches it. The good news is that we just don't that have that in Go. For the simple case of, well, strings can't be nil for a start, and the second one is that we have multiple return values. And this, this eliminates the need to use nil as a, oh, something bad happened. Sentinel. So, the bottom line, don't check for nil receiver. Get good test coverage. Use your vet and lint tools, and you just won't have that problem. Um, and so the last, the last one I'll talk about, and I will go quicker because I, geez, I've spent a long time on that. Um, the error handling strategy we have is using the error interface, not panic. Um, because panic is not an appropriate type of control flow. The, there are two or three cases inside the standard library where panic is used, and none of them are for errors. They are to simulate non-local control. In the, uh, in the JSON encoding package, because it's a recursive thing, they use, they use panic to quickly leave all those stack frames. Um, it's not, it's, I doubt, we, I doubt anyone would write it like that these days. But that's, that's how it was written. And so the only cases inside the standard library where panic and recovery used like that are to do simulate non-local return. So the fundamental is that panic must truly be the last resort. Um, you, it, it's used only if the conditions are impossible, like, a, like I can't happen here, division by zero, those kind of things. Um, Worse than panic in your own code is a panic from a library. Um, nothing is going to be worse for the Go ecosystem than if people start to think other library code, I need to protect against it, kind of panicking happily by wrapping it all in a recover. Um, and the, another thing is that panic unwinds the stack in which it happens. You can't recover it from a different stack. And so it, it, 
it, it's an incredibly hard thing to use as, a, as an error recovery mechanism to the point that just don't use it. Like use, use error values. Um, and, and a sneaky way that panics actually sneak in is the uh, log package has fatal and panic. Now panic is obvious, but fatal is less obvious. Fatal just prints out a message and then calls panic. Um, in, my, in my opinion, there is, no, there is no reason for a logging package to be able to crash your package. Um, it just shouldn't be there. They're just a mistake. Um, and g g given, given that you, you could easily be, be forgiven for thinking, like we have debug, warning, um, error, panic, or error, fatal, you could think, well, that's just another logging level. Except this one, this one line, can crash any Go program in the world. Okay, we'll, whoa, okay, that's all right. Yes, okay, we've got half an hour left, and I'm going to give some examples here. All right, this, so, we spent an awful lot about talking about how to handle errors, what's the right way to do it, how to inspect them, but the best thing about error handling is just not having to do it in the first place. And so these are two examples of, uh, inspired by John Osterhaus book, about how he calls it define errors out of existence. So in these ones, we're going to look at um, two bits of code, and we're going to just make it so you don't have to check the error. Not by ignoring it, but just making it so there is no error. So let, let's, let's have a function that counts the number of lines. Um, we pass it in a reader, and it's just going to loop over, loop, loop over the reader, counting, uh, counting lines as it goes. Until we get to the end of the file, the count is the number of lines. Um, at least, that's the code that we want to write. But there, the error handling isn't correct in this code. There are, there are a bunch of problems. For example, uh, we increment the count of lines before checking the error. That looks weird. Why would we do that? Like every single other place in Go, with the exception of the read type methods, we check the error first and then we don't touch the other values. Why do we do it this way? The reason is, how do we, how do we count a file that doesn't have a, a trailing new line? We have to we're basically counting the number of times we call read string, not the number of lines we read. I think there's an example missing there. Um, okay, there is an example missing there. I'll have to put it there afterwards. Um, Now, in Russ's errors proposal last year, he made a good case that in most of the cases, error handling can obscure the operation of the file. This is the code that we want to write. We want to some type, the number of lines, and say for every single line, inc increment the counter. And so the simple fix to this was not to somehow improve the error handling or come up with clever handling. It was to use a better type. And this is the whole reason why um, Read, read string are discouraged because they're just too hard to use. We have the scanner, and the scanner works as we expected. The scan method returns true if it has matched a line of text and not encountered an error. So the body of our for loop is only called where there are lines of text in the scanner's buffer. This means it correctly counts when there are no lines of text in the buffer. The previous version would start at one, even if we read no lines. But more germane to this discussion is scan returns false once an error is encountered. So we don't need to check the error every single time we read the line. That's abstracted away, hidden inside the scanner. If you want to get the error back out, we just need to check it once using the sc.error method. Um, and sc.error nicely handles turning EOF that's expected when you get to the end of a file into a nil so that we don't even need, so that we can clearly handle that. We don't even need to check what sc.error are, is if the file ended as expected, not we hit some kind of IO error or ran out of disk space, 
we, we just get the nil as we expect. The second example, um, this we talked all about reading, let's talk about writing. So imagine we have some kind of server, some kind of HTTPS, HTTP type server, and somewhere in the guts of our code is this thing called write response, which takes a writer, a status, headers, and a body, which is the components of the HTTP message. So first thing we have to do, we have to write out the HTTP status code and check the error, blah, blah, blah. Then for each of the headers, we have to write the header out and check the error, blah, blah, blah. Then we have to, then we have to include a trailing new line because that's how HTTP works and check the error. And then lastly, we have to copy the body and this time not check the error. So the thing is that not only is there a lot of repetitive error checking in there, every single, diff every single error check was slightly different. Let's have a quick look at them again. This one's just a straight error check. This one happens in a loop. This one, uh, because uh, th this one is slightly different formed, and this one we don't check. The only reason that we have it on two lines is because copy returns two parameters and we only need one. So that's just a bit of syntax that the language forces on us. Don't forget also, we have different errors declared at different scopes. Written in idiomatic code, this in idiomatic code, there is still a lot of, a lot of noise there. So how can we make this better? We can just put a little type in the middle of it. We have this thing called an error writer, and this is derived from um, a blog post on the Go, uh, the Go blog, which uses a similar a, a similar type and a, a slightly different example. So error writer uh, is an encapsulation over a writer and it keeps an error. And so anywhere where we use like the regular IO writer, we can substitute our writer, which if there's no, uh, if a previous write through this error writer had failed, we just return the error. If, uh, if not, we, we attempt the write to the underlying writer keep that error, and continue on. That's the, that's the important thing. We never, return, we never return an error from this writer because we never want, uh, e even though our code can now just ignore the error, if this writer was then passed to something else, we don't, wa we don't want it used. Imagine if this writer was somewhere in the chain of a gzip, uh, a gzip and a json encoder and something else like that. It still has to fulfill the writer contract. So even though we're kind of, memoizing the error, we still have to keep, we still have to fulfill the contract. But look how this dries up the write response method. We just construct our writer over the one we were given, and then just, we literally get to write the code that we want. Print the, use fprintf to print the, the status message. Iterate over each of the headers. Write the additional head, write the additional RNN, copy the body, we don't even need to care about the response from copy, and then, because that's captured inside the error writer, and then finally return error writer.error. So th this, this, is, this is my interpretation of Osterholt's uh, comment of define errors out of existence. We've changed, we haven't just said we're not checking the errors, we've changed the way, that we, we, we've changed the way the code usually by inserting or choosing a better type, that means we just have to check less often. And that means that there's less error handling code to fill up your, the, the, what is very prescriptive business logic here. Like this is the form of the HTTP message. You have to be very specific there. Yes? Um, how do you feel about iterating through headers uh, even if there was an error before? Well, the, th the thing is, um, if there was an error, this is going to be a no-op. Yeah. Uh, it'll, it'll, yeah, it's, you, you spent, you'll, you'll potentially, if there was an underlying error writing the first thing, you're spending a little bit more time. So it's the question of how likely do you think that there will actually ever be an error? Um, I'm making the argument that errors um, occur, but as a percentage are relatively infrequent. 
like at the, the total time, like if you've got a busy web server, the total time spending um, process, like uh, sending responses to the other side that is disconnected is going to be non-zero. But of the total number of, like if you're only handling a few responses, the, the microseconds to um, make, make a few no-op calls is trivial. And if you're making a large number, a large number of calls, the number that you expect to fail, if, if this is true, the number you expect to fail should be low. So it's very, it's very unlikely that this is going to do unnecessary work. If you expect them to always fail, if you expect 50% of your, of, your, of your request to fail, and you can show in profiling that you're spending too much time sending, uh, doing, doing a little bit of string formatting to send to the other, to just throw on the floor, then yes, you probably shouldn't use this mechanism. But I doubt that that is going to be your performance problem. If it is, you know exactly where to fix it. You can't use this license. You have to have a big comment that says, we have to check after every one because half of these requests, half of these responses always fail because our clients always disconnect. But I don't know about your situation. You seem to be very concerned about the performance and that's very, that's very important. But If, if that failed often, yes, that would be a lot of wasted work, but errors are not the, you, you, you have to check because something could fail, but that doesn't mean it's always going to fail. Um, I, I, I would have to fall back on, let's actually profile it. Like that is really not a lot of wasted work. Um, and yes, I, I, I do need to move on. Um, the last one in this section is only handle an error once. Um, what do I mean by handling an error once? I mean checking the error, like, like some value of checking. checking. Checking the error. In this example, we're not checking the error at all. We're throwing it away from right. So making less than one decision, ignoring the error, is definitely a mistake. You should never, you should never ignore the error unless it's a, a very deliberate choice. Like, there's no comment to say, we ignore the error because we know we're being passed a buffer and it won't ever return an error. That's just wrong, wrong, wrongly written code. But equally, this here is not right either. What's happening here is if the error is nil, we're writing a line to a log file and we're returning the error. This is, what I this is the argument that I make, that this handles the error and that handles the error by passing it back to the caller. You can, imagine, you, you can imagine the output. If every single uh, function in the call chain logged the error and passed it up to the caller, who logged it again and passed it up to the caller. In fact, I can tell you exactly what that looks like. That looks like the startup of JIRA. For the people who are sniggering, you know exactly what I mean. That, the, the, the Java pattern of log an exception and pass it back and, and re-throw it tells you nothing. As I said, the caller is probably doing the same thing. And so all you get is just what is effectively a materialized stack trace. Couldn't write it because IOEOF. Couldn't write the config because IOEOF. And at the top, you're probably just printing it out anyway. <coughs> and apart from the verbosity, which is really just a, just a, a political statement, the problem with logging and returning is that it is super easy to forget to return. It's OK if you forget to log it, but if you forget to return, it's the, it's the overall pattern of log and return that makes it too easy. The, the important bit is not the log line. It's completely unimportant. The important bit is the proper error handling by not continuing in this function. So only handle the error once. If you check is error equal nil or do some kind of assertion like is it a timeout, then you're only allowed to make one action. If you log it, you shouldn't return it. Now that's rarely going to be the case. That's rarely going to be the case that's the right thing to do. Normally when there's an error, you can't continue with the rest of your functions. So the only thing you can do is return. So by definition, don't log it, just return it. And a bunch of stuff is happening. Obviously, the Go errors 
uh, changes which are going to include, include the stack trace, which is probably what a lot of a, a, a lot of this log and return kind of behavior. It's manually constructing a set of breadcrumbs, like where were you when this panicked? Um, because at the top, if you just print IOEOF, you have no idea where this came from. And of course, that was the genus for the package errors package that I wrote, which was inspired by a dozen others to do the same thing. Um, so this is an error that's going to change um, with the 1.13 error changes because errors will have a stack frame and be able to point to where they came from. Um, it's just not clear if that's going to happen this release or the release after or if it's going to be reworked. So now we have, now we have a choice. I have about 10 minutes, like we really can't go past, we really can't go past about 5.30. So I can either give a, different, give a different example or who would like to see an example of writing a table-driven test? Table-driven test? Four-ish hands. Who would like to see other than a table-driven test? No. <laughs> Same. Um, given, given, um, you, 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 you can you can read the rest of you can read the rest of it. I, I do want to go through um, the the table driven test exercise because it it, it it gives a lot of examples on how to uh, how to how to. It, it's table driven tests are quite a neat thing in Go because they let you add test cases very quickly. So speaking quickly, we have a split function. It just splits strings on separators. How do we write a test for that? Everyone knows that. Test split. We have what we got, what we expected. We probably use something like deep equals to say, are they the same? Um, the next question is, well, OK, we've written, it, we've written one test. Do, what, what's the coverage? What's the coverage of that? Well, it turns out you can use uh, the built-in coverage tool that comes in Go. And that gives you uh, your pass minus cover profile, which writes out a little, a little file about what it did. And you can inspect that later on with Go tool cover function that gives you the coverage per function. So this just gives you an overall summary. And this breaks it down by function. This is not a very exciting example. There aren't any many branches, so there's good coverage. Um, I use this so often that I have, this is, this is a bash alias that I have, which basically does the, the same two things there. So in any, in any package, ugh, my, my, my go path is completely messed up. Um, because of the demos I was doing last week. Uh, I can't show you that, but you, 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 you can imagine that gives you the coverage. Actually, I'll just do it in a different RC. Um, hope. Yep, and you get, you know, a, with, with one command, a so that's basically the way I run my tests all the time. I just type cover and look, look at my coverage. So now we have one test. We've got good, good coverage, but given there aren't many branches, we probably need to test some boundary conditions, like what happens if we split on the wrong separator? What happens if we split the string and there isn't a separator? And so we end up with, so we, we now have three test cases. They all look about the same. But the thing is that there's a lot of duplication in there. Like every single thing, with the exception of the input, the output and the name portion of the test is the same. Like that, that, that's, that's a lot to copy pasta, especially if you discover that um, maybe, maybe you want to slightly change, the, like, like the, the check logic is, is repeated and you have to do that many times. It's a lot of duplication. Now, this wonderful tradition called table-driven tests, and I do not know the, um, other than it started in the standard library, I do not know the, the originator of this. Is, is this kind of form. We make, it, we make a type called a test. We fill it up with test fixtures for the input, we, the input we want, the output we expect, and then we just loop over them. So we've consolidated all of the, what used to be those very repetitive test functions 
into one, one test case. So these are different fixtures for the split function. And in fact, we can dry this up a little bit more that because we're declaring this test's variable at the local scope, like we want to probably call inside functions for different kind of functions, not split, we want to reuse this structure again, we declare all that stuff locally, we can use a, uh, this form to both declare it and initialize it at the same time. So now adding new test cases, like for example, what happens if there's a trailing separator is just a matter of just adding fixtures to this table. It's very, it's very clear what's happening. All of this stuff is related to the split function. Okay, so now, now it turns out that test case didn't pass. And so a few, that brings into, the, into the, a few things that we need to talk about. The first one is it just says expected ABC got a slightly different ABC. Where did that come from? Which test case failed? Because we moved away from having one uh, test per function, we've lost the name. So a bunch of, you, you'll see a bunch of styles because it's very much an area that is, is still evolving. But the first thing is that because this is a slice, well, we can use the index of the slice. Um, so here we say test um, i plus one expected got. And now when we run it, it at least says test case number four. I expected this, I got that. Um, that's better than nothing, but you saw we had to do like a little bit of fudging because st uh, slices are zero based and this is one base, and like humans want to count in one, like when we think of test case number four. And also means that we need to be consistent, like across all the test cases that you, all the test fixes that you write across all the packages in your code, across your company, there needs to be some standardization on are we zero based or are we one based for our test codes, test cases. So perhaps a better pattern, um, is we can recover the name by, well, this is just a struct. We can put fields in there, so let's just put a name in there. Um, then when, if the test case fails, we can print out the name. Um, that's better, it's gonna give us something to search on, to find, it also um, recovers that comment that was previously lost because it's just a comment, it's not printed out anywhere. Um, the previous example using, uh, using the test index requires you to do a lot of kind of brace matching. Like if you've got really big fixtures, it may be really hard to figure out what is number four. Like if it's a really, some really complicated, some complicated fixtures. I can show you some of the, some of the test cases from my project. You know, long, long, long. Like very detailed kind of, data structures, so finding the fourth data structure entry could be quite complicated. So using a name is quite good. And then we can, this, this is the final form. This is, this is one that uh, Mike, uh, Mitchell Hashimoto uses, and I, um, I, I credit him with being the first, first one to do it, that, which is realizing that, well, uh, name is really a key, a key to this test. So instead of using a slice, we can use a map. And so there's a map of test case names to this anonymous structure of test fixtures. And this has got one other very useful property. Because map iteration order is undefined. Um, I'm just going to say random because it's easier. We don't need to have that argument. And the, and the reason this is super useful is it means that now your test cases are not run in the same order all the time. So you can spot when your test cases are not hygienic because A, change some state, and B is testing that state that's being changed. If you run them, run them out of order, now all of a sudden the test cases can't rely on that. And it, it, it lets you pick up some stuff where, uh, where, where the test cases are not hermetic. So it's really good to run them, run them out of order. Now there, there are two other, there are two other problems. The first one is that we're calling t.fatal. So in this loop, the first test that fails, t.fatal is going to cancel, is going to 
uh, print out this line and then exit the test case. This is one of the use, uses of non-local return that Panic is used for in the standard library to let, to let test cases basically bail out. The problem with that is what if we're refactoring and we break all the tests? We make a big mistake. This is only going to print one entry. So the first one that fails and it's going to be an undefined which one it actually is, is going, to, is going to print out. So if you're doing a refactoring and you make a break, it's not clear whether you've broken one test or whether you've broken all of them and you're just seeing the first. So what we want is, uh, now we could use t.error, which marks the test as failed but continues the execution. The problems with that are when you do that, the, your test, uh, now, now you've failed at this point. If you had several other cases in your test case, you need to be very careful that you don't accidentally execute into those when the first one has failed. Where you see t.error used in, te in tests, you often find that these tests uh, work great when everything passes, but when there's a test failure, they become incredibly fragile. They don't just report an error, but then immediately panic afterwards. So t.error is kind of a... Um, is, 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 is kind of a smell these days because we now have the wonderful thing called subtests. Now subtest gives us back the ability to have one function per test, like we pass in an anonymous function. So we can fatal f as much as we want. It just cancels this inner block rather than the outer block, which means we recover, we can print all the failing subtests without having to write any special, um, special clever logic. The other one is that they have really good names. Their name isn't just a string in the output, it's actually part of the test name because this is built into the testing framework. So we can even uh, run a subset of a particular test's cases <coughs> by passing in this regex. So this is going to say, run any, any subtest called trailing. So we've got back all the behavior that we had prior when we wrote each test case individually with a lot of duplication, as well as having this, this very simple way to add, te add test cases. And you'll see this used a lot. It is the, it is the majority of the way of writing tests um, in Go, certainly in the standard library, because it's, it's such a low impact way of just adding new fixtures as you find test cases. And combined with fuzzing, which gives you adversarial inputs, which you can turn into test cases. This is a really good way of improving your coverage and your confidence in your code very, very, very quickly. Now the last thing, the very, very last thing I'm going to talk about, and this is the last error I mentioned, is now we've got this failing test case. We've finished me messing with the, uh, the, the framework or the, the, te the test harness. We've actually got to fix the test case. What's the problem here? They're not the same. Reflex says they're not the same. Um, obviously, people with good eyes can spot that there's an extra space at the end there. We don't know where it came from. But believe me, if this is not a simple comparing two slices of strings, but two complicated structures together, that one little space in there is going to be very, very hard to spot. So an easy way to... Um, uh, perhaps a way to, to improve this was in, would be to use percent hash fee, which is a special kind of formatting, func formatting verb that says print it out uh, in a Goish declaration. It's not, you can't directly copy and paste it back in, but it looks a lot closer. So expected a slice of string A and B and C got slice of string A and B and C and an empty string on the end. So it's very clear what happened there. And, th and this works for simple inputs. But rarely are your, your inputs simple. And to give, give an example of where percent %v does not work, let's take, a look at, let's take a look at this. We have type t, it just has a field called i, and x is a slice of pointers to t of 1, t of 2, t of 3. y is a slice of t of 1, t of 2, and t of 4. So obviously, they're not the same because the values of i in those slices are not the same. Now, if we use percent %v, as we expect, it's just going to tell us the pointer addresses. But unfortunately, percent hash fee 
can't do any better. It tells us in a more verbose kind of way, like this memory address is a pointer to a T, but it can't tell us the thing we need to know, which is the inside, what the value of I inside that T. So it turns out percent hash V not actually a success. Uh, it's okay for small cases, but uh, when, when the comparisons get very obvious, get, get very complicated, it kind of falls down. And this is what I meant by, you, you might start off with a simple, simple test case. You might think, you might think, oh, th th this is fine. I'll, I'll, never, I'll never have to change these bits here. I can just copy and paste this over time. But then later on you find that, oh, I need to start using percent %V for some of these cases. And then later on you find I need to do, inspect them a bit more. And so each of the test cases which you said were just, like, don't look at that, that's not the active part, each becomes slightly different. So that's another reason for using a table-driven test, that you can consolidate your logic. So the final thing I'm going to introduce you to is something that I've been using a lot, and it really, it really is the dark scouts. This is uh, Josiah's Go CMP library. Uh, it is specifically designed as a replacement to reflect or deep, deep equal. It, uh, it kind of, it, it has more capabilities to define what equality means. It can deal with very complicated s situations. You can tell it to ignore certain fields. Um, it follows Joe's personal bias that uh, you shouldn't use deep equals on private fields and is very, very picky about that. So obviously, you can use it where you'd use reflect up deep equals. Are uh, x and y equal? False. Of course, no, no, they're not. But where it really pays for itself is the diff function. And the, the diff function is the whole tamale. This returns you a textual diff of what is different between x and y. It doesn't just tell you they're not the same. It tells you exactly where they're different. And this, this, is, this is worth the price of admission. For example, in this case, and I, I know it's not the, it's the syntax only a mother could love, but it says, this is a, sl a slice of t at index two, so the third position. The value was i, I was expecting a three, and I got a four. Um, you, you, you do need to kind of, kind of learn, its, learn its language. But the thing is, it's very consistent in the way that it does this. And once you learn, learn how to interpret that, it tells you exactly what was different, rather than somehow printing out all of these inputs and all these outputs. And believe me, when this input is not a slice of three pointers to T, but a huge gRPC structures, like enormous gRPC structures that you have to tell the difference between one field, somewhere in there is different, this pays for itself. So the conclusion is bringing in, bringing in Go CMP, using, uh, you say do a difference. Sometimes you have to pass uh, some option structures for things like if you want it to, if you want it to um, not, not compare some fields or if you want it to uh, deal with, with types that have private fields, you, you need to pass those options there. But it gets only one line in your test case. And then you just say, if the diff is not blank, if something is different, then we fail and just print out that diff. And so here, again, it's, it's it, unfortunately, this example turned out to be not the world's uh, most, most clearest, but it's saying this slice of string at the, f at the fourth element. So the previous one had, did nothing, had nothing at three. This one has a three. It was non-existent. This one had a space. <coughs> so it's saying they're a different size. And not only are they different size, but the value in that that was uh, not expected is actually is Rather, not being present, it's a space. So with that, uh, I'm, I'm going to close. Um, we didn't get through everything. I'm, I, I didn't really expect to. Um, I even if I just sat and read 20,000 words to you at a monotone, I couldn't do it in four hours anyway. Um, but as I said, this, all of this material is uh, yours to read, to use, to refute, to discuss, what, whatever you want. These are my experience is writing Go over the last five or six years. Um, and we can close, I think, on a, a few questions, but we do have to get out of here because uh, it's 5.30. Um, but with that, we'll take any final questions or 
If you're coming to the conference tomorrow, you can buttonhole me there. If you're coming to the, sorry, not, not on Friday. If you come to the conference on Friday, you can buttonhole me there. Um, I'd love to, love to talk to you about any of your questions. Usually the answers are longer than the, uh, are longer than the question because we really are kind of discussing subjective things. Like the, the final goal is better, clearer, more readable Go code. And there is no hard and fast rule. It's always, um, it's always it's a, a set of informed decisions driven by experience. So uh, with that, if there are one or two questions, then we might, then we might quit. Okay, yes, and then I'll take the next question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, wonder you haven't spoken about the init functions. That, we as a team found it that mysterious, like you have several packages, several init functions, mm -hmm. the order in which they get called, and then mm -hmm. trying to mess it up. So init functions are effect, well, not effectively, they are global state. Let me, let me show you, there is no difference between There is no difference between <coughs> under the hood, these generate the same code. They do the same thing. So if you're looking at init functions and saying these are weird, these are unpredictable, all of that applies equally to global variables. Um, if, 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 you, if you believe what Peter Bergon is saying, and I, I definitely subscribe to his view, you shouldn't have global state, you shouldn't have init functions. They, for, for all the reasons that, that uh, global state is bad. It's a singleton, it's hard to test, it's hard to replicate. Because, it, because everyone knows its name, they can change it on you, it creates tight coupling between packages. Um, and I, I think perhaps your, your, your difficulties with init functions are a symptom of that. Like the, it's not that inner function is, is weird to know about which order they care about that they're called in. It's that you're depending on some global state being set at a particular time. And that's, that, that's, always, that's always the, 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 the trick. Um, Robert Martin says, um, mutable variables, to know the state of a mutable variable, first of all, you need to know what time it is. And, any, and, and when, you, when, you face this, when you face the problem like that, before I know what I know what value what the contents of this variable are, I need to know what time it is. It, it's it's clear that there's it's clear that there is an, an, an ordering problem there. If I'm too early, it'll have a different value. Um, so I, that is possibly the worst non-answer I've ever given, um, other than to say, um, you. My my advice would be you you would you really really need to limit you. Uh, init variables, you really need to limit the use of them because they are symptomatic of global state, which is the, the fundamental problem. Um, was there a question over there? Or just put up your hand. Yes? Um, can you share your thoughts about differences involving a library or a package and application? Okay, the, the, the difference between a library and an application. Um, mo most, of, most of the differences. certainly in the past have come down to how you think about your dependency management. Um, when you're a library, you're going to be mixed in with other code. And so, uh, uh, say, say, say you have three different, uh, three, three, three different libraries that, depend, uh, that also depend on a logging library. So they're all going to be mixed, they're all going to be mixed together with that logging dependency. Um, in, in the final application, there's going to be one, one version of that logging library that will have to work against it. So as a library developer, um, it used to be extremely difficult to, well, first of all, specify any, ver any information about the version of the dependency you're using. Or you could say, all you knew was from the import line, I, this program needs logris somewhere to be there. Um, there was no way in the import line to say this version of logris, there was no way in libraries to specify I have a transitive dependency on Logris. This fortunately has got a lot better, this is getting a lot better in depth and got a lot better in Go modules. Now from the point of view of an application, the application owns all the dependencies. It's the one that should declare we use this version of Logris and this version of the XML parsing library and this version of the JSON library and this version of gRPC. The application uh, developer is I think actually in a much easier position when it comes to, when it comes to writing Go programs. Like you can be very strict uh, to, to give, give an example of how, well, the, the vendor folder. 
all the dependencies that your program needs, you kept a copy of them in the vendor folder. You could. You don't need to, but you could keep a copy of them in the vendor folder. Vendor folders in libraries uh, were extremely problematic um, because when you bring a bunch of libraries together with their independent vendor folders, you must collapse them down onto a single one. That was an insolvable problem. The reason why we have DEP and now Go modules uh, that, that removes, removes the vendor folder. So to, to step back and answer, the, answer that more concisely, um, writing applications in Go is pretty straightforward, even if you have multiple dependencies. Writing a library in Go and having it reliably mix, uh, able to be mixed into, um, in, into a larger application was pretty difficult when all we had was Go get. It's certainly getting a lot better. Um, Glide, Go Dep, um, and, Go, and Go modules make it um, more tractable to actually, as a library writer, to say, my thing works with, can only be mixed into projects that have dependencies between these ranges. So is that, is that an answer? Like, like I'm, I'm speaking mainly from my experience of, uh, of not necessarily writing the library, but how they interact in the bigger ecosystem of other people using them. Is that a? So, so you would actually, when you're writing some library code, you would actually lock it uh, with uh, some glide or that or something against some um, or you, you would try to use one version of the system just to go get um, from, from, from the point of an application developer, you have, you, you have the ability to say, my program needs exactly these versions. From the point of view of a library developer, um, if you say, I can only be built against these versions, you make it very hard to be, to be mixed into another program. So you usually have to specify version ranges. And while that's a, a well understood concept, until, until, uh, until GoDep and modules, we didn't actually have any tools to do that. It was very difficult, and that's why a lot of, um, I'm going to make a subjective statement here, but my observation is that Go packages did not tend to have very, Go libraries did not tend to have very deep dependency chains because it was actually impossible for a library writer to cleanly say, I only work against the, uh, this, this downstream dependency. Um, so my, my answer is mainly, mainly uh, phrased around tooling rather than uh, rather than any kind of uh, sp specific coding style or something like that about about writing a library. Um, maybe maybe one or two more questions. Yes. Uh, how is package errors going to change the argument when you go? How is package errors? What's on? Uh, how is how is the X errors package? Um, I'll, I'll refer you to nope. Oh yeah, this will do. I'll refer you to this document. Um, the the super short summary is the error values is that. And th this is the contentious part. Values returned from errors.new or form to error f will actually now contain the stack frame in which they were called. So they, they, help, they now know where they came from. Um, the contentious part is not so much that, but how that information is printed out. Um, that's what people are getting very upset about. But um, if you're used, used to um, uh, uh, the, pack, the er errors package or the number of others that um, put a stack frame, wrap a stack frame around another error, that logic is being brought upstream into the Go standard library. Um, this, is the, um, this is the one you want to look at. The um, Somewhere in there, which I can't find immediately, is the... Uh, There are, there are somewhere, uh, somewhere in these listed the actual issue numbers where all the discussion is happening. But um, this, this bigger page is linked from the Go blog. I just made that bigger. Um, go to draft. And so this is the reference to the, the three proposals. There's, there's, there's some more stuff there. But Basically, start with that. Uh, one more question, then we're definitely cleaning up. 
Last question? Once, twice, oh yes. Yes. What is your experience with the draft proposal that will be coming up in one thirty? Um, the usage wise. Uh, I haven't haven't actually played with the errors package because uh, fundamentally, like I'm still on one twelve for my project. Um, I can't really use it use it in anger with my day with my day job until until it actually gets there. Um, I've talked a lot to Marcel. We run into each other um, on the road. Um, the the, un the underlying. Uh, the underlying design is the, 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 same, the same as error. And I want to be very clear that um, the, errors pack the error package that I wrote is really just another reinterpretation of about three or four of them that we wrote at Canonical and many others that other people are doing. So I'm not saying that I, this is my idea. In fact, it, absolutely not. All I, did was, all I did was just apply my logic of let's get rid of as many parameters as we could to make it as, 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 as simple and dumb to use as possible. Um, The other answer I can give to you is that when something is incorporated upstream into the, into, uh, into the Go standard library, there is no value in me maintaining the errors package other than to provide a path for people to migrate to the standard library. No Go programmers are served by there being a competition for yet another errors package. So um, I, the, the value I see in my errors package that I wrote is to socialize the ideas which have been picked up by, by, the, by the Go team. And, and again, these are not my ideas. These are ones that have just been flo floating around, uh, 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 around enough. If anything, I was just lucky that I was a, a smart aleck and managed to snap the, the PKG um, project name on GitHub. That's probably the thing that made it more popular than others. It's just shorter. That's all. But this is the, f the, what, this, this is the future. Like, like the, what's, what's going into Go is what we, is what we should use. This is, there is no value from having a competing standard anymore. The, the, the value in terms of showing the Go team that this is a real world usage, and there's actually uh, real value to get from having stack traces has been made. It's going into the standard library. Um, and with that, um, is Valentine, Valentine here? Do you want to close out? Yeah. Do you, do you have any closing thoughts? Do you, is there any information for people for, for later in the week? Um, should we get out? Should we pull the fire alarm on the way out? Like, what should we do? <laughs> yeah, so I guess it's the end, right? I mean, feel free to stay around till like 6.50.